My name is Karen Barker and I'm Executive Manager and Head of Government Projects at the Australia India Institute. So welcome to this workshop on groundwater sustainability. This is the first in a series of four workshops that we're running throughout the month of May uh, in the Australia India Technical Program in Water and Food Security. And we're delighted to be partnering with the Australia India Water Centre for this series of workshops. Um, before I go on, I'd just like to pause and take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. And just a note for those joining us from India, we make this acknowledgement of Australia's traditional owners in recognition of the ongoing and unbroken connection between Australia's first people and the land we call Australia. So today I'm joining you at this event from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and extend my respect to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining us for the workshops today. So I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you this morning joining us from India and this afternoon from Australia, and to our distinguished guests and speakers and participants. Hope you're all well and keeping safe from COVID. I did just want to let you know briefly about a change in our program. Unfortunately, we won't be hearing from Ms Mukherjee, the additional secretary at Jal Shakti Ministry, or uh, Sri Yadav, the joint secretary. They've had to withdraw from this event due to unforeseen circumstances. However, we do hope that they will be back to join us for our final workshop in the series. So the overall aim of today's workshops is to exchange knowledge and experiences in water resource management, and also to provide you water researchers and water professionals with an opportunity for networking and to support existing and future collaborations in water between Australia and India. So we look forward to hearing from our presenters and experts later in the program and from all of you in the discussions. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the Honourable Lisa Singh, Lisa is the CEO of the Australia India Institute. She's a former Australian Senator, and actually she was the first woman of South Asian heritage to be elected to the Australian Parliament. She's also Deputy Chair of the Australia India Council. And in 2014, she was awarded the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman by the President of India for building friendly Australia India relations. And that's the highest civilian honor for a person of Indian origin. So Lisa, could I invite you to say a few words and perhaps formally open this workshop? Thank you very much, Karen, and namaste, everyone. Good morning in India and good afternoon in Australia. It's with pleasure that I, I welcome you all to this workshop on groundwater sustainability hosted in partnership with the Australia India Water Centre. This workshop is a part of, an, of activities of the Joint Working Group convened under the bilateral MOU on water resources management. And that MOU is led in India by the Ministry of Jal Shakti through the Central Water Commission and Nas National Hydrology Project. And in Australia by the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Uh, as uh, uh, Karen has shared, um, it, it is unfortunate that due to unforeseen circumstances, we won't be joined today by distinguished guests from the Indian Ministry of Jal Shakti, um, but we hope that additional Secretary Mukherjee and Joint Secretary Yadav can join us for our final workshop. Yeah. Of course, these are series of workshops, so there's so much for us to collaborate on over the coming weeks. We are, however, delighted that we are joined with Ms Lynn O'Connell, Deputy Secretary, Australian Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, with us today and also the Australian Government's Department of Education, Skills um, uh, and uh, Employment is also generously supporting these workshops. So I welcome Dr. David Atkins, the Secretary, Assistant Secretary uh, International of the Australian Department of Education, Skills and Employment. And I would also like to welcome the lead of the Australia India Water Centre in India and director of IIT Guwahati, and that is Professor Sitaraman. Welcome, Professor. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Institute, I'm very honoured to welcome you to this of first of four workshops in the Australia India Technical Exchange Program in Water and Food Security. 
At the Institute, we work to increase the policy and public importance of India as a crucial partner in Australia's future and of Australia as a crucial partner in India's future and provide leadership on the nature of a closer, mutually beneficial partnership across a wide range of interests. Food and water are the core of the United Nations Development, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Water scarcity around the world is expected to be exacerbated by rapidly growing urban areas, placing heavy pressure on neighbouring water resources, and Australia and India are no exceptions to this. So a collaborative effort between our two countries could not only address these challenges for our countries, but also allow us to be world leaders in food and water resources management. Australia and India renewed their Memorandum of Understanding on Water in 2020 to facilitate cooperation in surface and groundwater training, education and research, and to achieve water security for agricultural, urban, industrial and environmental purposes. So over the next four weeks, we will be hosting these workshops to facilitate the exchange of knowledge and experiences in water resource management and food security between our two countries and to provide opportunities for networking and collaborations between water and agricultural researchers and professionals in the longer term, which is equally as important. We will be focusing on a number of topics, including soil and water management for food security, wastewater re reuse management and sustainability, and water policy for sustainable water futures. And of course, today we will be discussing groundwater sustainability. I think as nations reconnect after two years of COVID, the Institute really hopes to reignite research and collaboration through these workshops with the spirit in which the MOU was renewed. There are important lessons about water management that the two countries can learn from each other. Working together on challenges faced by both countries can help us find innovative and impactful solutions to our shared challenges. So to allow researchers to connect, the Institute has developed the Australian, Australia Researcher Cooperation Hub, or what we call Arch India, which supports with the support from the Department of Education, Skills and Employment. Arch India is a virtual platform that helps researchers build relationships, share information and expertise, and explore funding opportunities for academic mobility and cooperation. Arch India is now open for early access, and I encourage you to explore the Arch India website, which will be shared today in the chat. In the past two years, the Australia-India bilateral relationship has been significantly elevated through the comprehensive strategic partnership and also recently through Australia's update to its India economic strategy. And then the most recent, of course, uh, signing of the Australia-India economic cooperation and trade agreement. So it is now clear that our two countries are coming together like they have never come together before. And I found this to be very true in every part of my recent one month long visit uh, in India during which I met a, a range of key stakeholders in the bilateral relationship that all, all felt that the momentum in our, in our relationship is going from strength to strength. So 2022 is indeed shaping up to be one of the most significant years for Australia and India's ties. And I'm very excited to be seeing this group of experts here today to discuss the importance of groundwater sustainability as a means by which we can come even closer together to solve some of the most important pressing policy issues facing both of our countries and indeed our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it is indeed an exciting time to be working in um, between Australia and India. And could I also uh, encourage participants today to explore and register on the Arch India website. The link has been sent through the chat. We'll be using that website to promote some new initiatives to support research collaboration in water, including in water, in the coming months. And now, could I please invite the director of the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, Professor Sitaram, to make some remarks? Thank you. Namaskar. Very good afternoon to all of you. The very distinguished uh, speakers and participants from both India and Australia. 
this uh, series of four workshops which will be held in this month for the Australia India Technical Exchange Program in water and food security is a very critical topic. Now, first of all, let me congratulate the organizers for taking up this particular topic. Water stress has caused countries around the world to consider ways to mitigate the impact of increased population as well as climate change. I think groundwater sustainability is one of the key aspects because many countries heavily depend on groundwater. Friends, this uh, topic, which is uh, goes on for four workshops in the, in the series, where topics like groundwater monitoring, groundwater quality, managed aquifer recharge, transboundary cooperation, planning and allocation, demand management, is a, along with the groundwater and meeting the future urban, agricultural, industrial water needs in the changing climate, scenario, climate scenarios is a very important topic what uh, the organizers have chosen. As part of the sustainable development goals, water and food security takes a major uh, step. The, it's very important that these goals to apply every nation and every sector. And in particular, now Australia and India have come together to work on the, the issues on water in a collaborate way. So, which is a welcome move. Water and climate change are very closely linked, which explores how water and climate change are and extricably linked to each other. So I feel, you know, nature-based solutions are the ones which we need to look at. I think there are good practices because time memorial India knows that it only gets water rainfall in three months in a year, three to four months maximum in a monsoon. Okay, now I think it's a monsoon period at the place where I come from because this is the heaviest rainfall area in India. Uh, the northeast particularly the megalai you know where we receive close to about 4000 to 5000 millimeter an annual rainfall and i i know it is the coastal areas of australia is not going to receive such large <laughs> rainfall so i wanted to tell my friends that you know india is not short of water but unfortunately you know we are also resorting to so many other technologies for water resources but we need to learn how to store this water, which we knew that it only comes in four months. It's not going to change. So time memorial, it is for four months, monsoon period, which will be there. So we need to learn how to storage. I think that part we have forgotten. Many, many of the you know, good practices which were there in ancient India are forgotten. And we are also followed like any other nation. Uh, building large dams. India is the third largest dam building nation in the world today with 5,800 large dams. And uh, even I, I can go on saying that uh, India is the one country which is still building large dams, 300 dams in the Northeast itself. Okay. So I think we need to look at nature-based solutions, which refers to sustainable management and use of nature for tackling socio-environmental challenges, which is posed by the water scarcity particularly when forests upstream are kept intact. Water and soil runoff will be regulated by trees. As uh, Ms. Lisa Singh said, water and soil are intricately connected. So it safeguards the reser reservoirs, particularly if you can uh, control the soil erosion, you know, uh, and also water to ingress into the ground. That's where the groundwater sustainability also comes in. And this uh, uh, reducing the costly cleanup efforts and also ensures the continued supply of water in, in the ground. So actions to protect sustainably manage to restore natural or modified ecosystems that addresses societal challenges effectively and adaptively. Uh, it's very critical for the human well-being and also to reap the biodiversity benefits. 
So I hope uh, this workshop will uh, talk about, and our honorable, I would like to mention our honorable prime minister, Sri Narendra Modi's statement, catch the rain where it falls, when it falls. So you know where it is going to fall. And you also know when reasonably, because the, today's the prediction of weather is so good. Okay, so we know where it falls also. So we need to store that and use it. So in this direction, and uh, India and Australia team has come together. And we have started Australia India Water Center with more than eight universities from Australia and 15 universities from India come together. It is actually a virtual giant center established by a consortium of Australian Indian universities, research institutions and water businesses to promote cooperation and collaboration in water research, education, training and capacity building. And this is where University of Western Sydney led by Professor Basan Maheshwari and uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, led by me, uh, were taking these aspects to work together on Australia India water collaborations. The center actually provides a platform for long term partnerships and dialogue between Australian and Indian water researchers, policymakers, industry partners, and non governmental organizations to work together for a common goal of UN Sustainable Development Goal 6 ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. The center is also focused on collaboration in transdisciplinary research, capacity building, and knowledge and technology transfer, particularly in aspects of water and food security, safe drinking water supplies, river health, water energy food nexus, water for livable cities, and other related facets of mutual benefits to Australia and India through the following activities such as uh, development of tools and techniques, establishment of a joint online master's program in transdisciplinary water resources management, both the uh, University of Western Sydney and University of Technology, Guwahati are working together to establish this joint online master's program in collaboration with all the universities who are partners to Australia India Water Center. And also we are planning to conduct capacity building and training. Right now one is going on, Young Water Professionals funded by uh, Government of Australia, jointly with Jal Shakti Ministry. So I would like to thank uh, both the ministries for coming forward to support a uh, very important topic. And I uh, believe Government of India, Jal Shakti Ministry has actually uh, agreed to support in the next year on the same program of uh, Young Professionals Training and promote transdisciplinary research, socioeconomic and cultural aspects, women empowerment, citizen science and community engagement in water resources management. So these are actually very critical issues because water is a, encompasses a very large uh, facets of the both science, engineering and social science. So uh, this uh, would also support expertise of the center partnering with international uh, experts uh, that is the, uh, provides a networking and people to people contact between India and Australia. I think this is a very, uh, I mean, I feel uh, because I'm, I'm part of this, so I don't want to pack my own back, but uh, it is a very good initiative between Australia and India. Uh, and particularly, I would like to congratulate Professor Basant Maheshwari in taking the lead from Australia. And particularly, he has also done a lot of work on groundwater sustainability, where you know he has worked with uh, village farmers and made a network and uh, a lot of awareness and they are the owners of their uh, water in their plants. So they, they should know how to manage that. So groundwater management along with other uh, water resources is very critical. So just before concluding, I would like also throw a light. As I told you, India is not short of water, it is short of storage. So we need to look at very innovative ways of storage and particularly Australia should look at uh, because it is mostly coastal cities. See, your urban areas are mostly in the coastal areas. So you should look at what is called as downstream water management through rivers and streams, where you, know, you can store the water closer to the coast. So what we call coastal reservoirs, which will be much more sustainable actually, because uh, your, your cities are located in the coastal areas and people are located in the coastal areas. The industries are located in the coastal areas. So you, instead of uh, building dams upstream and uh, stopping them, there will be almost uh, you know, the downstream, all the river will be dry. Instead of that, you take the coastal reservoirs very close to the coast before joining so that water does not get wasted and not get mixed up 
with the entire water will not get mixed up but uh, india has also should look at this particular aspect because even our coastal areas are developing our habitat along the coastal areas are developing and we also have 7600 kilometers of coastal area so which will provide us and also many of our rivers flows and we are unable to even store even with the, even with the large number of dams third largest uh, dam building nation we are hardly storing less than 10 percent of the annual rainfall we receive in indian land mass so that means there is enough scope to store another five percent which is not going to change any scenario uh, to the uh, to the co the the ocean uh, also because there's still large amount of water flows in and along with the silt and so which is a, a necessary thing so my suggestion is we need to look at the different aspect of river management the entire river catchment and needs to be looked at and there uh, starting from you know uh, the small storage ponds to uh, what is called as some of them underground dams and coastal reservoirs are also in addition to groundwater sustainability. So I hope uh, this workshop will address these issues as a total solution for water resources management uh, uh, along the entire river uh, catchment area. So in then you know we will have a complete solution for a water and also we may be able to solve the issues of water problems. Otherwise, you know, we, we, because water is intricately linked to the economy of a nation, you know, without water, not just the drinking water alone, without water, we will not be able to uh, solve this. So with these few remarks, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this time. I thank you very much. And I wish the workshops a great success. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Professor Sitaram. That was really interesting. And um, I love the catchphrase, uh, catch the rain where it falls, when it falls. Um, but as you say, it um, raises a lot of issues around storage and, and getting it to the right people at the right time as well. So there'll be plenty to talk about in our discussions. Um, could I now please invite the Deputy Secretary from the Australian Government Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, Ms. Lynn O'Connell, to make some remarks? Um, I believe you're going incognito <laughs> under another name um, uh, yep. on our screens, but it is you, isn't it, Lynn? Yes, yes, it is. And thanks very much. Karen, you can hear me all right? Yes. All good. And um, I'm, I'm here using the um, facilities of my colleague, Alex Flood, who will be joining you in person the moment I finish using his own uh, name, but it just made it easier for me to be able to uh, join in the meeting today. So um, good afternoon, distinguished colleagues, delegates and representatives of the Australian and Indian water sectors. I'm really grateful to be able to attend the workshop today. And I really would like to pass on my acknowledgement to um, colleagues from the Ministry of Jal Shaktri, so Joint Secretary Yadav, and of course, additional Secretary Mukherjee. And I'd really like to um, for someone to pass on my personal acknowledgement to additional Secretary Mukherjee because uh, she and I have held a number of forums under the bilateral MOU to progress it and have always had really productive discussions and very productive um, outcomes. So I, I miss her here today uh, and acknowledge that that's not, uh, that was unavoidable for her. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the Honourable Lisa Singh, the CEO of the Australia India Institute, and, and you got an excellent acknowledgement earlier, Lisa, so um, well done. Uh, and also Professor Sitharam, who's just given um, his address. And, and uh, Professor, you talk about the rainfall patterns in, uh, in India, and you pointed out that on the east coast of Australia, we experience usually much greater rainfall. And is as is always the case with water, there's either too much or not enough. And in Australia at the moment, we have experienced some floods down the east coast of our country. But as always, it's not evenly, the water is not evenly spread across the landscape. So we still have, or have just had a couple of areas coming out of droughts while um, some areas are under flood conditions. And I'd just like to um, acknowledge the challenges that those people in our flooded areas have um, at the moment and our hearts go out to them as they deal with that. So 
Um, me being here today is really to take the opportunity to highlight the importance of our water cooperation as part of our broad bilateral relationships between our two countries and to, if you like, underscore the authorising environment for you to continue to have these really terrific exchanges and productive discussions across our two nations. And I've spoken in the past about the sort of common challenges that we both face in sustainably managing our very, very precious water resources. And we're both focused with that um, very difficult balancing act and balancing the needs of water across our communities, across our industries, including agriculture, and of course, for sustaining the environment at this time of great change. And we've already touched on the impact of climate change will have on our ongoing water resources for both of our nations. So I think we both understand the complexities of working together at all levels of government to deliver better water resource management outcomes for the whole of the country. And indeed, last week I had the wonderful opportunity to spend a bit of time with my um, colleagues around our states and around Australia to discuss things like a, a new national water initiative. So critically, both of our countries need to actively manage the challenges in groundwater availability and, of course, groundwater quality. Our farmers rely on groundwater for irrigated agriculture use and groundwater is vital for urban water supply in India. So the water management challenges that we all face are absolutely in real time. Um, they're very persistent and they demand sustainable and very forward looking solutions. And really, that's why we're all here today. That's why we're interested. That's what we wanna see um, as an outcome. So as I said, there's an authorising environment for what we're doing today. We're here to act on the mandate that we've jointly agreed in 2022, sorry, in 2020, when our secretaries signed the Australia India, India Memorandum of Understanding on water resource cooperation. And that MOU really supports our bilateral knowledge sharing and our capacity building. Um, and it's an important part of the comprehensive strategic partnership between our two countries. So we're also here today to strengthen those people to people ties in the sector. And it's often those people to people ties that to deliver a result that wouldn't have otherwise be thought about. So we want to leverage the full benefits of the relationships between Australia and Indian officials, our experts um, and professionals in this crucial aspect for both sides and be able to build a shared agenda for addressing the water challenges of the future, acknowledging that we each have some potentially unique um, circumstances, but we can benefit an enormous amount from the sharing. So the aim of today's workshop on groundwater management is to advance our understanding of how to ensure lasting water security for both urban and agriculture water users. And it's really encouraging to see that this workshop is part of a series, so it's not a one-off, it's a part of a series in which we'll cover other topics of importance in water resources. And my hope is that together, we can go into the details of how technical capabilities and policy frameworks can further contribute to water and food security. And I can assure you that Australia remains very committed to our cooperation with India. And I personally look forward to the next meeting of our MOU joint working group with additional Secretary Murkerji. And we hope to be able to schedule that in the coming months. So thank you very much to the organisers of today's workshop, as well as all of today's speakers in advance and attendees. And I hope you have a really enjoyable and educational experience that's profitable to both our nations. Thank you, Karen. Thanks very much, Lynn. Um, really appreciate um, hearing about the context um, uh, for these workshops and also um, you know, just the significance that we do have to place on, on water security going forward. So thank you for those comments. Um, could I please now invite the Assistant Secretary International from the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, Dr. David Atkins, to make some remarks. Thank you. David. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I'd like to um, 
thank you for the for the introduction and also for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to attach myself to the acknowledgement of country that you gave. Uh, um, and note that in my case, I'm speaking from Ngunnawal country here in Canberra. I'd like to also acknowledge um, the fellow speakers in this part of the program. Um, uh, yourself, uh, Dr. Barker, uh, the Honourable Lisa Singh, uh, Professor Sitharam, uh, Ms. O'Connell, uh, thank you very much for your very insightful remarks. Um, and uh, the topic of this, of this uh, workshop takes me back to my graduate student days where I was thinking hard about uh, how silica um, behaved in aqueous um, solutions. So that's been um, quite lovely. Uh, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment is committed to contributing to the, the vibrant bilateral relationship that exists between India and Australia, uh, and that this year celebrates its 75th anniversary. I read that that can be a, a diamond anniversary, but other years can also be attributed to diamond anniversary, but 75 years uh, is quite the milestone. Uh, and we do this through uh, encouraging education, skills and research in particular, including through the strategic uh, partnership uh, agreement that was signed by our prime ministers in 2020, and also associated with that a skills memorandum of understanding uh, and other programs. Um, the department has also been very pleased to support uh, this workshop uh, under the um, Australia, Australian Researcher Corporation Hub India, or Arch India, Arch I, and we love the logo. Um, which is an Australian government initiative delivered through partnership by and with the Australian India Institute. We see great value in facilitating conversations between Indian and Australian researchers, universities and industries. By sharing experience and expertise, we can tackle shared challenges that can support future growth and prosperity for both our nations. Um, uh, Australia's long-standing research relationship with India continues to evolve and deepen. Australia is in the privileged position of being India's fifth largest partner for international research collaboration. Indian and Australian researchers collaborate across a diverse span of disciplines, particularly resource management, like today, health engineering and physical sciences. Uh, today's workshop makes an important contribution to the ongoing effort to strengthen and deepen research collaboration between India and Australia and fosters dialogue between our researchers. Um, as has been noted, we share challenges around water and food security particularly as both seek to promote agricultural endeavors on dry continents. Uh, I was reflecting that uh, when I lived in, in, in India in Chennai, the first Tamil word I learned was uh, um, probably a bit rusty, but tanya or water, uh, just underscores that personal uh, importance that water plays to all of us. Um, this workshop will provide a, a great opportunity uh, for participants to build and extend their networks, share knowledge and lessons, and re-energize discussions on research and collaboration and I want to join in celebrating this initiative and the connections that will be made. Um, finally, an unexpected benefit that has emerged from the, the recent pandemic is the shift to virtual platforms, which enable greater participation in events like this one today. Uh, and Arch I, I think, is a, a fabulous initiative in that space. Um, it's impressive to see the strong interest in this event, and I wish you all a successful workshop. Thank you. Namaste. Thanks very much, Dr. Atkins. And, um, uh, as a member of the Australia India Institute, I'd just like to thank you and the department for the practical support that you provide to boost research collaboration, including in this key area of water, soil and food security. So uh, thank you and thanks to all our distinguished guests for their remarks this afternoon and this morning. Um, we're now moving into the technical part of the workshop and I'll just briefly run through the format with you. Um, we're going to have two 20 minute presentations uh, followed by some breakout room discussions, uh, which will go for about half an hour and you're going to be automatically allocated to a room so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so that's a chance for you to make your contributions uh, to the discussions. And we're going to hear back uh, from the breakout rooms um, uh, in the reporting back session. That will be followed by an open forum. And the open forum will commence with two short presentations uh, by our additional panelists, and then Q&A. So we're going to be receiving Q&A via the chat. And that will bring us to the conclusion of the formal part of the program, but we are going to invite researchers and water professionals to stay on for additional half an hour of networking. We're setting up some breakout rooms which have got uh, some themes allocated to them relating to groundwater. And so if you can stay on for the next half an hour, um, to network with your 
um, counterparts, uh, that would be that would be great. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Dr. Nanda Kumaran. He's the former chairman of the Central Ground, uh, sorry, the Central Groundwater Board in the Department of Re Water Resources, River Development, and Ganga Rejuvenation in the Ministry of Jal Shakti. Dr. Nanda Kumaran's roles have included the Central Groundwater Board and Central Groundwater Authority, and he's played a key role in framing the policies related to sustainable management of groundwater in India. His expertise includes a range of areas, groundwater exploration in alluvium and hard rock areas, assessment of groundwater resources, sustainable development and management of groundwater, and managed aquifer recharge. So Dr. Nanda Kumaran, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on the road to groundwater sustainability and how to get there faster. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for the nice introduction. And uh, good morning to all the participants from India and a very good afternoon to all those who are joining from Australia. I'm really honored to uh, be invited for a speech in such an important workshop. And I congratulate the authorities of both Australia and India for starting this initiative, which is definitely a great step towards achieving sustainability of water resources. And with your permission, I would like to share my screen. We are here to talk about groundwater sustainability. I'm not going to talk about the importance of groundwater to this audience, because all of us are aware of its importance to both the countries, India and Australia. I'm, we all understand that as far as India is concerned, India is the largest user of groundwater in the world. We know that. And we also know that groundwater is a very important resource in ensuring the food and water security of the country, because we use almost 80% of our uh, groundwater for meeting nearly 80% of our domestic requirements and definitely more than 50% of our irrigational needs. In addition to being an important buffer for climate change impacts. So I would, within the limited time available, I will touch upon some of the issues which I think is important in our road to groundwater sustainability. I would like to start with these slides to put the things in perspective, because I want to emphasize the fact that water is a finite resource and whatever water we had at the time of formation of our mother planet, the same amount of water remains almost today as well. There has not been any significant in increase in the quantum of water that is available on Earth. At the same time, our population is spiraling from about 6.6 .6 billion people in 2007. We expect to have around 9.3 billion people by 2050. And when a finite resource is being shared by more and more people, it is quite natural to have a shortage of the resource. And that we are facing, especially in a situation where water use has been growing at more than twice the rate of population increase in the last century. So unless a miracle happens and our population gets really stabilized, we will continue to experience the effect of water shortage and sustainable use of water is our attempt at postponing a future water shortage. That is, the better we do it, we will postpone the day or the D-Day where we will really be forced to take adaptation measures and we will have no other option left but to reduce the use of our water to the extent possible. So with this introduction, this is what is what the predictions say. This is a graphic by the World Resource Institute, which says that by the year 2040, and this applies to both India and Australia, both of us are in the same boat, 
it is predicted that if the business as usual scenario continues then both our countries will be in a stage of high water stress by the year 2040 and this of course has taken into account the possible impact of climate change as well but the predictions are quite ominous and if this happens we will really be struggling to find fresh water to meet our resources now before i go into the sustainability issues i would just like you to understand how the groundwater development or groundwater use has progressed over the years or evolved over the years in india in the pre 1960 period groundwater utilization was minimal and it was not considered a significant resource for users other than domestic drinking and domestic purposes then a sea change happened in the decades 1960 to 1980 where the green revolution happened in india and we became self sufficient in agricultural production but at the cost of a very large scale groundwater development through millions of tube wells drilled across the country but we should also appreciate the fact that towards the end of this period the government also recognized the environmental impacts of groundwater over exploitation and as far as back as 1973 the government of india made a model bill of groundwater regulation and circulated to the state governments for modifications and adaptations so they have been really far sighted in that initiative then between 1980 and 2000 the concerns of groundwater depletion and contamination became more prominent and the at the government level we started initiatives for artificial recharge to groundwater conjunctive use of surface and groundwater resources groundwater regulation initiatives were started towards the end of uh, 1990s and at a small scale awareness creation and capacity building activities were also initiated in the decades of 2000 to 2020 over exploitation and contamination of groundwater resources the impact became more severe then in a major initiative the program of aquifer mapping and management was launched by central groundwater board which envisaged mapping of aquifers in detail and preparation of management plans for sustainable use of groundwater available groundwater available in those aquifers discussions happened on climate change impacts then a large number of national schemes were launched some major schemes like mahatma gandhi rural employment guarantee scheme and prime minister's krishi sinchai yojana and several state schemes which aimed at sustainable ma water management with collateral benefits for groundwater was also happened and we started thinking seriously about water use efficiency measures and in the current decade that is from 2020 the focus has now shifted to long term sustainability and holistic water management demand management is being dealt with with much more emphasis than earlier there is a lot of effort to start groundwater management with community participation and these things are currently going on now coming to the availability of groundwater in india as per the latest assessment of dynamic groundwater resources that is the quantum of groundwater that is replenished every year our stage of groundwater extraction that is the proportion of groundwater we use vis a vis the available water is around 62% and the thing to note is that nearly 89% of the groundwater which is being utilized in the country is being used for irrigation purposes for agricultural uses 
so this looks as if the situation is not very alarming because we still have around 39% of groundwater left for future use but the situation is not that rosy if you see this picture we can understand that the groundwater extraction is not uniform in the country as a whole because we see a lot of large and yellow patches in the northwestern part of the country especially encompassing punjab haryana delhi rajasthan and parts of gujarat where the extraction is quite high followed by some areas in the uh, south of the country in the states of tamil nadu karnataka and andhra pradesh where the extraction is very heavy at the same time we have got the eastern coast and the northeastern part of the country where the groundwater extraction is minimal and still there is a lot of scope for further extraction of groundwater for either irrigation industrial or domestic purposes so there is a widespread disparity in the extraction of groundwater resources in the country for various uh, for totally different reasons because we will commit uh, come to that in the future so in the later slides but in the northeastern part of the country we have got plenty of water available in the aquifers that is in the indo gangetic uh, plains we have got very prolific aquifers and this extraction these red patches which we are seeing they are really a result of commercial exploitation of groundwater resources for mainly for commercial purposes export oriented agriculture that is the major reason for the over exploitation in the northwestern part of the country but when we come to the southern part of the country especially in the hard rock terrain groundwater as it is is used for supplementary irrigation only or subsistence irrigation because the rock formations which constitute these aquifers can hold and transmit very little amount of water when compared to the unconsolidated alluvial aquifers so the reasons are totally different but it remains a fact that there are certain areas in the country where we have got heavy exploitation of available groundwater resources affecting their sustainability now when we talk about the groundwater sustainability challenges i have tried to put it into two different heads that is the challenges which are resource related and the challenges which are governance related when we come to the resource related challenges the major reason is the hydrological complexity of the of the of the country as a whole because we have got a host of environments in which groundwater occurs we have got alluvial formations which form uh, very prolific aquifers just to cite an example we have got the the famous ganges basin the ganga basin which constitutes only 8% of the total geographical area of the country at the same time this basin itself holds almost 30% of the available groundwater resources in the country that much water is available in the indo gangetic uh, plains of the country whereas the hard rock areas the peninsular part of the country have very little groundwater because of the nature of the aquifers then the distribution for the same reason because of the complex nature of the uh, complex geological or hydrogeological nature of the formations we have got a really inequitable distribution of the resource which again makes the groundwater development highly skewed some areas have got very heavy development some areas have got suboptimal development certain areas we have got water logging either in the coastal areas or in the command areas of major uh, canal command canal irrigation projects that is also a problem we have got water quality constraints either caused by geogenic contaminants like fluoride arsenic iron etc or by anthropogenic contaminants because of uh, industrial effluents nitrates phosphates etc etc so these are all constraints for sustainable use of groundwater but one advantage of uh, these constraints are because we can deal with them with technology because we when we have better tools for 
searching for groundwater, assessing the resources, and uh, treating water logging, etc., or quality remediation techniques, we can deal with them to some extent. And probably uh, the Indo-Australian collaboration, which is being discussed here and which is really working well, can do wonderfully well in this sector, where the introduction of new technology can help us overcome many of these challenges. Now, coming to the governance-related challenges, these are more complex because there are several dimensions involved in this. We have got the political dimensions, the economic dimensions, the social dimensions, which are all intertwined in these, these constraints. I have tried to list the major constraints, the governance-related constraints here. The first one is the top-down approach, which have been traditionally followed by the governments anywhere, not only in India, probably. Most of the programs are designed at the national level and regional concerns are not factored in because which can really spell disaster for a country like India. Because a program which is designed for Punjab or Haryana can never work for a state like Tamil Nadu, Karnataka or Kerala, which are in the far uh, ex, uh, extreme south of the country, because the situations are totally different. All the things are different. The economic setup is different. The social, uh, social economic status of the people are different, etc. Then we have got a really fragmented approach to governance because there are, I'll be showing it in one of my next slides, because there are plenty of agencies which are which are dealing with groundwater, but there is no sufficient coordination between these departments because everybody, it is just like uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing type of thing because somebody is concerned about saving the groundwater, whereas somebody is concerned about increasing crop production, but not considering the savings which have to happen along with that. Like that, there are several departments and agencies which are dealing with groundwater, and there is definitely a lack of coordination between these agencies. And traditionally, there have been there have been a high emphasis on supply side management, that is increasing the supply. We know that any resource crunch can be managed in two ways. Either you can increase the supply of the resource, or you can manage the demand or reduce the demand. So supply side demand uh, pertains to or uh, means the increase in the resources available by replenishing them using artificial recharge or manage um, aquifer recharge or rainwater harvesting or whatever other means are possible. There has been a lot of emphasis on supply side management from the government side over the years. And there has been lack of attention on demand management with very few schemes aimed at demand reduction due to associated constraints. We will come to that in one of uh, the later slides because there are the major problem with demand side management is government cannot do it on its own. It cannot be done by a government circular or a government funding or whatever it is. Then there has been a major problem which uh, has been discussed in several fora, that is the water energy nexus. We have got the policy of free or subsidized power for agricultural use in many of the states in the country, which encourages wasteful use of the precious groundwater available because you don't have to pay for power. So you don't understand the value of the water which we use. Then inadequate stakeholder participation has been another major reason because the, uh, the community is not at all interested in what is going on. They just feel that government is implementing some policy and government is implementing some program. So they will, it is their responsibility to see that it works well. We are not concerned. Then legislation issues have been there because some of you will be surprised to know that the groundwater 
rights in the country are still associated with an act which was promulgated in 1882, which is called the Indian Eastment Act, which says that water or groundwater is an easement to the land. So plainly put, you are free to use the groundwater below your land as you wish. Nobody can control it. Then regulatory efforts have been initiated by the government right from the 1990s. But even today, the groundwater use of use for agriculture is beyond the purview of groundwater regulation in India. So this also encourages wasteful use of water because flood irrigation is still practiced in a large part of the country. Wastage of a lot of water happens and there is no regulation to prevent this in the country. I was talking about fragmented groundwater governance. Here I have tried to list a few, both at the federal level as well as at the state level. If you take the case of uh, the Department of Jal Shakti itself, there are three organizations, Central Groundwater Board, Central Groundwater Authority, and we have got the National Water Mission, which uh, pioneers what uh, Professor Sitaram told, the Catch the Rain campaign. Then we have got the Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Rural Development, Urban Development, Earth Sciences, Science and Technology. There are several others, I've just listed a few. All these departments have some stake in the groundwater resources of the country. When you go to the state level, there are an equal number of agencies which are concerned with the groundwater or which are involved in the development of groundwater or protection of groundwater. But I should say that there is definitely a lack of coordination between all these ministries, either at the central level or at the state level. Now, these are some of the schemes which have got a bearing on the water resources as a whole. As I've mentioned in the first line of this slide, there has been no government scheme, Government of India scheme, exclusively for groundwater management. But I, should, I think I should qualify that statement by telling that right from 2020, we have got the Adal Bhujal Yojana, which is definitely a paradigm shift in the policy of the government as far as water management is concerned. This is a scheme which pilots participatory groundwater management in select water stress areas of the country, especially with community participation and demand management. And this is just in the, just in progress. A lot of the policy decisions of the government, I'm sure, will depend on the success of this scheme. In the years to come, it's a five-year scheme. It will, it is supposed to uh, end in 2025. By the time, in within a year or two, we will be able to see the results coming in. I hope. Then there is the National Aquifer Mapping and Management Program of the Central Groundwater Board, which aims to provide a framework for sustainable groundwater management by characterizing the aquifer dimensions and uh, uh, the aquifer characteristics and the water quality and develop plans for sustainable management of resources. So this will give us a framework on which we can uh, take up, based on which we can take up initiatives for sustainable groundwater management. Then there are plenty of schemes, some at the central level and some at the state level. Here, I have put those schemes in, in red which have got some bearing on the demand management as far as groundwater is concerned. There are hardly five or six schemes which are like that, which, have, which help in reducing the demand of water, groundwater, but all others are basically supply side measures and most of them are surface water based with some benefit coming to groundwater because of the increased recharge. So there has been an emphasis on the supply side measures over the years, and it still continues with the exception of Adal Bhujal Yojana. When you come to demand side measures, we see that in India, most of these have been pioneered by 
either ngos or communities themselves and these have been water budgeting and reduction in water management through appropriate interventions have been the hallmark of uh, these schemes some of the important success stories i have listed here one is the hibre bazar and ralegao city in maharashtra and there is of course the marvi initiative pioneered by professor basan maheshwari and his team which are working in rajasthan and gujarat we have got a very good example of uh, mr lakshman singh's initiative in the lapodia village of rajasthan then there have been some examples in uh, maharashtra and gujarat the problem with uh, uh, these demand side measures have uh, mainly been that whatever we see that these are mostly personality driven because when a person who has pioneered this initiative moves out of the scene most of these initiatives die a natural death there is uh, no progress beyond that that is our experience which we have seen and many of these schemes did not have government support adequate government support i see but fortunately this situation is changing now and government has been actively supporting initiatives in the, for the groundwater management through demand reduction especially in collaboration with uh, ngos like argium etc and scaling up remains an issue because i should uh, tell you an example that if any of you have visited hibre bazar you will see that for the last 40 years that has been just like an oasis in an otherwise desert area because it has been such a phenomenal success that really is to be seen to be believed but many other villages or the mandals or gram panchayats or blocks which are lying nearby have not followed their example they have not been successful in implementing the same initiative even in the nearby areas so scaling up remains an a uh, big issue in the case of demand management and again i should emphasize that atal bhujal yojana heralds a paradigm shift in government policy for groundwater management because the government itself is pioneering an initiative aimed at demand reduction and community participation now as i have mentioned in the title of my presentation that is how to reach the road to sustainability faster my first point is here that government or the authorities or the agencies involved should revisit the groundwater assessment methodology or i should again qualify it by telling that there is a methodology which uh, which says how it should be done but it is not strictly being followed because of the lack of reliable data and the current methodology aims mainly at assessing the resources which are replenished on a yearly basis how much water goes into the aquifer and how much water is taken out and then comes out with the balance and then for categorization of the administrative units the first suggestion i have to make is that the one problem with this assessment is aquifer desaturation over time whatever mining of groundwater has happened over the years is not taken into account in the present assessment uh, and excuse me dr nand kumar pardon uh, sir we are running out of time so oh, just i'll i'll finish in 2 minutes thank you then we need more realistic data on groundwater extraction state governments need to be sensitized on the importance of uh, this exercise and what we really need is aquifer based volumetric assessment and the nacum results will definitely help the practitioners do this and definitely we need to increase the Uh, monitoring network density which the national hydrology project will definitely help in achieving in the years to come then as i have already mentioned we need more emphasis on demand side management efficient irrigation practices because our um, irrigation efficiency is abysmally low you need to enable and empower the communities to manage their groundwater resources especially for a country as big as india it is not possible for the governments alone to manage the groundwater resources so it should become the responsibility of the communities to manage their groundwater resources through 
well prepared water security plants and the coordinated use of surface and groundwater resources for which some initiatives have already been done now iwrm framework especially australia is working a lot in uh, this regard i hope uh, the joint initiatives will definitely work more in this regard then other interventions can be these are difficult things politically but i suppose it has to happen today or tomorrow that is treating groundwater as an economic good and appropriate pricing of groundwater for various uses groundwater uh, use regulation for agriculture unless that happens we, it will be very difficult to go for sustainable management of groundwater then uh, manage aquifer recharge using wastewater which i i hope dr dillon will be telling us in detail then i have uh, just this summarizes how to balance the between the policy and the practice of participatory groundwater management thanks to my friend uh, himanshu kulkarni and this is my final slide that is water should not remain as the responsibility of the people in the water sector alone it should become everybody's business because all the ministries which use groundwater has a part in saving it or conserving it also including the ministry of agriculture ministry of human resource development ministry of urban development everybody can definitely play a major part in sustainable management of groundwater there are the list is endless there are several other ministries which can really work uh, for sustainable management of groundwater thank you for patient listening thank you very much Dr. Nanda Kumaran, um, lots of food for thought, and uh, um, it's a really great point that there's so many um, different players responsible for this issue, and we all have to play a part. Um, participants will have an opportunity to ask questions and make comments uh, later on in the in the workshop. Um, so, can I please introduce our next presenter, Dr. Peter Dillon? So, Dr. Dillon has led the um, Australian CSIRO research on groundwater quality protection, water recycling and managed aquifer recharge for almost three decades. He's led the team that produced the Australian guidelines for water recycling on managed aquifer recharge uh, back in 2009, and they're still the world's only risk-based guidelines for MAR. And um, uh, he and his team also developed the water quality guide for MAR in India. Dr. Dillon was founding co-chair of the International Association of Hydrogeologists Commission on Managing Aquifer Recharge for quite a long time, from 2002 to 2019, and uh, also participated in the, um, I want to say the MARVI project, M-A-R-V-I, uh, that started in Rajasthan and Gujarat in 2010 and continues to gather momentum to enable farmers to measure, understand and manage their groundwater systems in drought prone areas. So we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Dillon, on managing the risks of aquifer recharge with urban wastewaters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay, now I hope you can see the screen. Okay. Yes. So, um, what I'm doing is um, talking a little bit about um, managing the risks of aquifer recharge with urban wastewaters and in Australia and India. Um, but before I, I go into that topic, I, uh, I fully understand and really respect and uh, uh, in total agreement with the comments that have just been made by Dr. Kumarand and the uh, Nanda Kumarand uh, concerning the uh, supply side and demand side of groundwater management. So while this is focused on uh, the uh, supply side, um, it needs to be seen in that context. And as far as managing aquifer recharge, the um, the uh, India has uh, international leadership in that domain from a volumetric perspective. Uh, the uh, there's more than three cubic kilometres of 
managed aquifer recharge taking in place in, in India annually now, which is more than any other country. Australia has about 400 million cubic metres by comparison, so just over 10% uh, of, of India's. But uh, Australia has been doing more work with uh, uh, urban waters, and some of those have got some real relevance for, for India uh, for reasons we'll see later. So you can see in these little pictures, uh, some of the project sites that are, are actually happening. Some of you may have driven over the Ames flyover in Delhi and not realised there was a little um, uh, artificial recharge game taking place in there collecting the stormwater. Uh, and that little pond in the middle is, uh, is what, <laughs> what that is. And that's actually uh, resulting in infiltration and recharge to the aquifer. And there are various other others like the JNU campus. And uh, I've shown the Aha River in Udapur. That's actually uh, untreated wastewater that we're seeing there. Uh, so that's, if you like, unmanaged recharge of an aquifer with very poor quality water. So that represents the potential to not only, if we improve the quality of that water, um, preventing a pollution event, um, and we're already seeing some of the agricultural land in that area uh, being lost uh, because of the uh, contamination by the wastewater. Uh, but there's the opportunity to really uh, generate um, sub substantial new cropping uh, and improved, um, improved practices as a result of uh, better use of that water. The one on the left is a beauty. Uh, this is at Haridwar. Um, there's a series of uh, bank filtration wells along uh, the, uh, the Ganges in, in this area. And um, these are to uh, allow the water to infiltrate through the stream bed and then get sucked into those wells. The movement of the water through the aquifer improves the quality so that it can come out with the normal sorts of treatment can be used as drinking water supplies. This is in an area which is um, um, a very uh, heavily visited at, at certain times of the year. What am I doing? Sorry, oh, here we go. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, managed aquifer recharge and uh, the way it's practiced in both countries and um, and I'm going to focus on the um, health protection issues and draw some conclusions. And the sites shown in this picture are those that I've been working on in Australia. Uh, the first one is where I did my PhD on reservoir releases from the Little Para Reservoir into a stream that recharged an aquifer. The one in the middle is um, at uh, uh, Salisbury, uh, an urban area. It look, it's in the middle of an airport just here, so it looks rural, but um, it's collecting urban runoff and recharging that to a limestone aquifer. And the one on the, on the right at the top, is uh, the Perth Groundwater Replenishment Scheme where treated wastewater from Perth is uh, recycled, re-injected into the same aquifer from which it was drawn. And that's uh, completing the circle and enabling uh, a greater groundwater use than otherwise would be possible. And the one at the bottom right is a soil aquifer treatment example where uh, treated wastewater from Alice Springs in the centre of Australia is, is uh, intermittently ponded and infiltrates to an aquifer for irrigation supplies. Okay, so managed aquifer recharge is what we call a pur it's purposeful recharge of water to aquifers for subsequent recovery or environmental benefit. It's not a method for waste disposal. It involves management of, and monitoring of quantity and quality to ensure that the risks are acceptable. So it goes a step beyond artificial recharge. Evolution of groundwater. Um, 
uh, recharge augmentation has, has occurred with time and, and uh, managed aquifer recharge is what we describe as controlled recovery of water, uh, you know, the recharge of water with the intent of being able to pull that water back for various uses. And there are various methods that are available using stream beds, uh, modifications and bank filtration, water spreading, recharge wells and shafts, reservoir releases and soil aquifer treatment. And all of those I've just shown you in various examples. But um, unmanaged recharge is where we have stormwater drainage wells and sumps. They're used to get rid of stormwater but we know that the water is going to end up in the aquifer, but there's no consideration of, you know, how do we make sure that the water ending in the aquifer doesn't pollute the aquifer? And the same happens with septic tank leach fields and leaky sewage lagoons and, and mining and industrial disposal to sumps. They're often, you know, we, we, we can pretend to be blind to those. I don't know why this is flicking. We can be pretend to be blind to those, but ultimately they're going to have an adverse impact on groundwater quality. So what we'd like to do is to move from unmanaged to managed recharge so that we can be sure that we're protecting the aquifer. There's also unintentional recharge enhancement, for example, the clearing of deep rooted vegetation or spate irrigation or just the uh, seepage that occurs beneath irrigation areas. We do all these things not to generate recharge, but to, to, for, for agricultural crops. Uh, and yet the consequence is there's an increase in recharge. So when I'm talking about managed aquifer recharge, I'm not talking about those sorts of, of things. Okay. Um, in, in an urban setting, um, can you see my little pointer? I'm, when I use my pointer on your screen, does that show up? And I'm, I'm pointing at where water is coming into the, to the little circle on the left. Uh, and we're bringing in water and then there's treatment and then uh, it's used and then the sewage gets treated and then it goes back to some other, uh, and then it can get recycled and, and end up going back through the system again. So uh, often there's a, a storage phase involved in that where the aquifer is used. Where it becomes unstuck is when uh, there's bypassing of water treatment or of sewage treatment and people, unin uh, well, there's there's water gets used in a way that it shouldn't be used. And so the quality of the water can deteriorate. And so the aquifers can become at risk. And so can the people that are consuming the water that's used. So our aim is through, um, through guidance that have been, has been generated in Australia to try and overcome those issues uh, so that we have a sustainable system. Now, Dr. Nanda Kumaran has already talked about um, water shortages in India. Um, so beneficial and safe reuse of wastewater in peri-urban areas for agriculture would be a useful solution, uh, but one that would require local empowerment and training in order to be able to gain the skills necessary to uh, to do that safely and avoid some of those problems that I've just talked about. The other uh, sort of solution is, uh, as, uh, as also that uh, Dr. Nanda Kumaran has referred to, with the, with the MAVI project, as an example, is to help uh, villagers understand their groundwater systems so that they can use the water more wisely and they understand the benefits of op operating cooperatively. And uh, the project that um, Dr. Mahashwari has been running in, uh, in Gujarat and Rajasthan has been highly effective in bringing farmers to a, 
a, a new level of understanding that they will uh, accept and do things cooperatively that it would be extremely difficult for a government to impose on people who didn't understand their situation. In India, there's a lot of wastewater generated, uh, about 15 cubic kilometres a year in 2007. Uh, and uh, and uh, that only about 35% of that wastewater is treated. So there's quite a lot of opportunity for pollution of aquifers in areas where, where untreated white wastewater is not adequately treated. Furthermore, there are very few uh, capabilities dispersed through, through India for effective environmental monitoring of pathogens, pharmaceuticals, anti antibiotics, and so on. Uh, more, there's more capability for, for metals and nutrients and so on, but often the, the methodologies for sampling and you know, getting them to laboratories in time to make useful results uh, uh, can, be a, can be a challenge. So there are, um, I, I, I presented a figure where we, you know, there's an opportunity and a threat all embedded together. And by uh, giving people appropriate skills, we can turn the threat into uh, a real opportunity for improving health and livelihood. So recharge enhancement in India, as I said, is uh, India is the, the dominant country in, uh, in, in recharge enhancement. And uh, uh, IGRAC is the International Groundwater Resources Assessment Centre, uh, has documented around the world case studies where people have said, uh, have volunteered to put in information about their projects. These are the projects that have been put in for India, uh, a long way short of the probably million plus projects that there are, but it gives you some idea that um, there is uh, um, some aggregation of information that's occurring around, around the world. And you can show these for all the other uh, countries uh, uh, as, as well, but these are, uh, what I'm saying is India has got a lot of experience with managed aquifer recharge, but most of it is not with recycled water. These are generally with natural waters, uh, generally with uh, stream bed structures or rainwater harvesting. In Australia, uh, the situation has, has, has evolved so that um, we have a number of recharge operations. In fact, our largest recharge operations at the moment are with groundwater, uh, and that's in um, iron ore mining areas and in coal seam gas extraction, where the associated water is re-injected uh, for productive use. Uh, and in the urban areas, particularly in Perth and Adelaide, um, and more recently in, uh, in other areas, Melbourne and Sydney, uh, Melbourne and Canberra, there are uh, effective uh, stormwater and recycled water uh, MAR operations. The Beanie Up project is probably the Cinderella project for Australia. Uh, this is the Perth Groundwater Replenishment Scheme, where the Perth's uh, drinking water, uh, uh, wastewater from the from the wastewater treatment plant, the sewage treatment plant is taken. It's given a uh, high level of treatment before injection into the aquifer. There's, there were investigations undertaken to determine what level of treatment would be adequate to ensure that we could meet the ongoing uh, needs for water quality in the aquifer and for the water supply. And so that uh, was set up in 2017. It expanded in 2020 to 28 million cubic metres a year. Uh, there are now eight recharge wells, the deepest being 1,400 metres. 
going into confined aquifer systems, which are being which are the ones that are being used for uh, the Perth drinking water supply. So it's a great example of how you can take a waste and turn it into a valuable uh, water supply uh, of high value um, and ensure that you're doing it well so that there are no adverse outcomes. And that was made possible because we had Australian, we have a national water quality management strategy. It started um, uh, some time ago. Um, back in 1994, the policies and principles were developed and there's been various, uh, uh, the, the, it has evolved and there's been a return to some of the components of the of this program to make use of more information that's been de developed in the meantime. But the managed aquifer recharge guidelines are part of the water recycling phase two guidelines. This is what they, the guidelines are a, a book, they're publicly available. Uh, they're based on a risk management strategy. And we also have a book that was produced uh, to give examples of the application of the risk management approaches uh, in case studies that uh, applied uh, around Australia. So I think there's 10 case studies in there. And the process is, uh, starts with, um, with understanding what it is that you're trying to do. You do a desktop study, then there's some investigations made. Uh, and, but before you construct anything, you, you check that uh, you, you do your assessments and, and check that you've got enough um, controls in place to ensure that you won't cause any, any problem. Of course, you can't assure that because you don't know until you've started doing it in, in most cases because we don't understand every aquifer before we start injecting. So um, then there's construction, uh, the operational res residual risk management and then commissioning of the project. The hazards tend to be fairly common hazards and these are common to the other, the first seven are common to the other um, guidelines in this uh, set of documents in, in the water quality management strategy. And uh, then there are others that, are rel that relate to specific conditions uh, for managed aquifer recharge relating to the aquifer. And what we do is, uh, is an assessment. There, the, there are the hazards that are listed on the left. And then for each of those hazards, you look at a maximal risk assessment. Well, if we look at what the quality of the water is that's available before it's treated, is it likely to be a health problem or not? And a high shown as red, a red block here would say, yes, it's, it's going to be a problem. You need to do something about it. And then you go through and work out what you're going to do about it. You test that, uh, that method. You do uh, laboratory trials. You might then go ahead and do field validation. You then have enough confidence to say, yes, we've got that risk under, under control. So then the residual risk assessment, which is on the right-hand side here uh, shows that the risks have been reduced to a low risk, both for the, uh, the human health, drinking human health point of view, as well as from the environment point of view. There are various other uses of the aquifer, for example, for, for irrigation or aquaculture or for just for sustaining the ecosystems that are pre-existing in the aquifer. So, you do the uh, various uh, checks, investigations, demonstrate that you can manage the risks. You end up with all green lights and then the regulator will say, okay, you can proceed. And some of the ways in which you manage the risks are, are shown here. I won't go through them in detail, but uh, basically treatments uh, and um, and control measures, uh, things like uh, measurements, uh, measurements that might lead to a critical control point being triggered. 
which would then shut down the process. So automated shutdown systems uh, for some of these quite expensive systems like the Perth groundwater replenishment scheme. Now, we know that that, that works if you've got access to good skills in risk management, you've got good laboratories available for doing the pathogen and trace organic analyses and so on. If you're in rural India, you're unlikely to have um, that sort of resource base to work for, with. So rather than just say, oh, well, we don't know, we're not going to do any, any assessment, unmanaged recharge, let's say we make a qualitative management using a sanitary survey approach, understand what are the risks that are likely to occur just using visual cues or, the, or your nose to determine whether the water is likely to be of good quality or not. And if it's of poor quality, you can do things that would make the water safer, or you would say, no, we're not going to use this water for drinking water purposes. Um, there is an internet, and, and that's for the, the level of the 2014 guide, which was developed uh, for India. Other countries such as the US and Europe uh, use prescriptive management with specific requirements. They generally assume certain conditions prevail within the aquifer. Um, sometimes they are, they are a better approach to take, um, but they're not as good as uh, having uh, a, a risk-based approach where you're actually spending money as it's needing on the things that are needed. That noise might be Basant telling me it's time I finished, so I'll, I'll speed up a little. Uh, so just comparing the Indian guideline and the Australian guidelines, uh, Indian guidelines uh, in these things, um, the Australian guidelines do these ones, uh, and we see that there are some gap areas. And so in developing the guidelines we, for India, it was said, let's just say that we're not going to use them for uh, urban stormwater treated sewage effluent. We'll use them for natural waters, uh, no problems, uh, in places where they're not going to be going straight into uh, public water supply systems. And there are various other clauses that we, that we have. Uh, so the, the guidelines are set up uh, to ask some basic questions. It's like a, like a checklist approach. Um, you can do a sanitary survey. You can work out what, what's going on, and then you come up with uh, a plan. If you try to go to, a, to, to uh, um, either the project is unviable or it doesn't meet the criteria, then you need to have a look at, uh, at an alternative that does use a risk-based approach, but generally you'll be prevented from using that because you didn't have access to that data in the first instance. So th those guidelines were applied uh, to four or five systems in the in, in that 2014 document. In 2016, they were applied to another uh, about four, four sites, I think, might have been six, uh, within the Safpani project. Um, so there are a number of applications of, those pro uh, of the protocol in um, uh, India. And I'm getting close to the end now. Uh, here are some example, there are some other examples that we can refer to. And the, this is the, um, the uh, document um, a showcase for resilience and sustainability for managed aquifer recharge was produced by UNESCO uh, under the, author, uh, the lead author was uh, Yan Zheng. And there were uh, five sites in India and Bangladesh that were, were chosen uh, for evaluation. And the two sites that I've talked about are here today, um, the Perth Groundwater Replenishment Scheme is mentioned and is, is 
evaluated as well as the Salisbury um, stormwater scheme. So there's the, uh, the scheme, the, the ephemeral stream uh, recharge structures in uh, data ca catchment in, in Rajasthan, which is part of the Marvi project. Uh, uh, Site from Maharashtra, also with uh, percolation tanks, uh, site in uh, the Ganges Basin, where flood water is uh, infiltrated through uh, wicking um, wells, and um, the, the Haridwar bank filtration case, and another case which is uh, uh, which is the our only. Um, rainwater harvesting scheme, which was one in uh, Bangladesh, which is now uh, operated by uh, uh, the women of the, of the village. They form the management committee and they oversee the, that project. Oh dear. So it, it, I'm getting to, to the, this is my last text slide. So in, informal water and sanitation systems, if you do have them occurring, then shutting them down or converting it to managed aquifer recharge is better, which, which is necessary to ensure safe sources of water. So identifying these systems is a starting point. It takes skills to be able to do that. And that's something, maybe a centre like the Australia India Water Centre can really help with advancing. Monitoring of existing unmanaged systems will inform on their effectiveness problems and additional skills needed. So they could be case studies and you could imagine a whole flock of um, uh, postgraduate students getting involved and maybe even graduate students just getting involved in doing like that type of activity. They're learning something and contributing uh, something that can be uh, will be a benefit for the local community. Training is also needed for MAR implementers, their consultants and their uh, regulators to demonstrably manage risks effectively. Uh, uh, building research and measurement capability, particularly for water quality analysis, is really important to be able to manage the risks. And, uh, and I haven't yet talked about uh, aquifer ecosystems and ecology. Water uh, quality regulations uh, would be more efficient and uniform if they align with risk management. So water entitlement and water entitlements need to align with volumes available for diversion while protecting environmental flows. And that's something that also is um, not yet uh, occurring in India, but would need a great deal of thought to be able to do that effectively. MA needs to be well documented, uh, not just the technical elements, but the economics and uh, the uh, social recognition and support to demonstrate its effectiveness. So an Australia India water centre uh, has got the capability has got capabilities from both India and Australia that it can bring together and achieve some of these things that might be very difficult to do uh, uh, without the involvement of both countries. I don't know where these red marks are coming from. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, that that's that says this is the end. <laughs> But there are some resources that are available for you. I'm assuming that these PowerPoints are going to be available after the, uh, the workshop. And uh, so I thought that uh, that might save people uh, uh, in uh, a time in, in getting access to the resources that they need. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the workshop. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Peter Dillon. Uh, I think um, that was a really great presentation, um, even from a non-water expert's point of view, very grounded in um, some you know, really great examples and um, comparative uh, examples as well. 
Um, right, now we're going to move into our breakout rooms and we've got two questions on our program that we are going to discuss. The breakout rooms um, will, will be open for 15 minutes of discussion. We're going to ask breakout rooms number one to four to discuss the first question, which is on uh, the key issues, challenges and opportunities for groundwater research, uh, training and capacity building in the next five to 10 years. And the remaining breakout rooms, number five upwards, um, we'll look at the second question, which is about how we can grow and sustain collaboration between Australia and India. Um, and that might be through um, collaboration with researchers, government, private sector, NGOs and others. So um, our administrator is going to automatically invite you to a breakout room. You don't need to choose one, you're, you're being put into one. So it'd be great if you could um, start to move into those rooms and um, we'll see you again in about uh, 15 minutes. And moderators, could I remind you all to ensure that somebody is recording your session? Thanks. We'll see you in 20 minutes. All right, does someone else uh, want to introduce themselves? Sunil. Uh, I am Sunil Kumar, uh, presently working in the Government of India, Central Groundwater Board under Ministry of Jal Sakti. I'm chairman of the department and looking after the groundwater regulation as well as the this uh, groundwater quality assessment management and uh, the other part which are uh, or the whole gamut of uh, groundwater system in India. So we are basically dealing with the uh, entire India with the focus of the groundwater quality. It's uh, then assessment of quality and then finding the hot spot. Other part is basically knowing the how much water we are having. It's a suspend volumetric, and then uh, knowing the aquifer types, their extensions, their 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 capability to store and uh, give out water. So, and we are planning for the sustainable management of water for the future. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. All right, who else would like to introduce themselves just very quickly so then we can move into our question discussion? I, I, my name is Daryl Day. I'm the CEO of the uh, Peter Cullen Trust and uh, um, I've had uh, a little bit of experience with the SUT in uh, capacity develop between Australia and India and the, the water, particularly groundwater section. Thanks, Daryl. Who would like to go next? Surjitji, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Surjit Singh in National Institute of Hydrology, Roorkee, working in the Groundwater Hydrology Division. And I am in the, my uh, area of research is uh, mainly groundwater modeling and the river wine filtration, and also studies in the uh, uh, arsenic affected areas on arsenic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Prasad, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Or professor, I should uh, say. Yeah. Good, good morning and uh, good afternoon to Australia. Actually, I am uh, Professor Prasad from the uh, Department of Civil Engineering, Govinda Vallapant uh, University of Agriculture and Technology, Pantanagar. It's in Uttarakhand, and uh, yeah, we are uh, long associated with uh, Western City University uh, before I AIWSC uh, through Professor uh, Basant Maheshwari ji, and we have uh, mainly two projects working on uh, springs scheme for promotion of academic research and collaboration of Government of India. One. Uh, through IIT Karakpur as a lead institution and another through our own institution as a lead Indian partner, where uh, Western Sydney University, uh, they are collaborating. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, who would like to go next? Uh, Jay Prakash Verma, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, myself, Dr. Jay Prakash Verma, Assistant Professor in Institute of Environment and Sustainable Development, Banaras Hindu University. 
माई एरिया ऑफ स्पेशलाइजेशन इज एक्चुअली सस्टेनेबल एग्रीकल्चर एंड प्लांट माइक्रोवेव इंटरेक्शंस एंड वी हैव डेवलप्ड सो मेनी सो मेनी माइक्रोबियल कंसोर्शिया फॉर ड्रग टॉलरेंट माइक्रोबियल स्टेन टू हाउ एनहांस द एग्रीकल्चर प्रोडक्टिविटी एंड सोइल फर्टिलिटी एंड आई हैव आल्सो विजिटेड इन वेस्टर्न सिडनी यूनिवर्सिटी एंड एट मंथ वर्क एज अ विजिटिंग फेलो इन हक्सबरी इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ द एनवायरमेंट in the western sydney and i am associated with uh, professor basant maheshwari sir and we come together and work related to india water uh, this workshop and project thank you thank you very much uh who else do we have who hasn't introduced themselves so dafia barami would you like to introduce yourself Maybe Alex, we move to the question because the okay, time is short. The time is running out. So, would someone please volunteer as a uh, note taker and to report back, please, um, afterwards? I'd appreciate a volunteer to take notes and report back. So we need a volunteer, or a, we'll we'll nominate who is going to be. <laughs> I think Dr. Verma, would you be able to? Take the lead. I think that is more better. Sir. Sorry, my. I think so you can take the sir uh, lead and so from the questions you can. Uh, Professor Prasad, would you like to take notes of the discussion and? Uh, report back. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, okay. So you are right, you. note taker and reporting back. Thank you, Professor. So uh, the question is: What are the key challenges and opportunities related to groundwater in research, training, and capacity building for Australia and India for the next five to ten years? Over to the floor. Who would who would like to to start start off with their thoughts? Uh, let me uh, reply to this question. Uh, the, in in India, we are as Dr. Nand Kumar has told, we have just moved to the demand side management, and the government of India is expanding this scheme to the other states. where the uh, the groundwater is being taken out more like the, it is being over exploited so we need even more persons to be trained uh, in the participatory groundwater management and uh, seeing the experience of the past uh, we have seen that the, in india the, the agencies who have been involved in uh, uh, giving the training to the the, the, the uh, gram panchayat people Uh, they are not that much trained, or they are have limited uh, manpower, limited resources. So I think uh, uh, this is a this is the area where India and Australia can chip in together and uh, enhance the uh, the capacity of the uh, the gram panchayat, especially in those areas where the the blocks are over exploited, critical, semi critical. And uh, let us start focusing on the first part, the over exploited one. because those are the those critical area those require the more attention so i think in the next 10 years this will be the more focus area uh, how we can manage our resources budget our uh, ground water and utilize it more optimally so that the the sustainability of the resource can be ensured thank you thank you so much i i invite further <coughs> further responses perhaps i'll just um reinforce the importance of um collaboration on demand side management is certainly um both a lot of experience but also a lot of learning that uh, australia can can partner with uh with india in in that space we've been doing obviously quite quite a lot in terms of measurement of extraction uh, monitoring of um of the groundwater resources but also uh um 
approaches to water stewardship and uh, efficient, productive irrigation and also in the urban space. So um, I think there, there is quite a lot that um, will be really valuable to share um, and how that how that's best done um, is something we can work out. Some of it can be done online, but some of it will need to to be able to show and demonstrate and uh, and, and visit some of the, the the projects. Perhaps while I've got the floor, I'll just throw um, a second focus in. I think looking at a, a systems approach, uh, one of the biggest challenges is the quality of recharge of groundwater, particularly from the um, un, uh, unregulated, um, uh, unmanaged uh, recharge events from uh, both grey water and um, uh, urban urban runoff in particular. And I think uh, just looking at uh, approaches of how that that might be addressed because the the uh, uh, poor quality recharge of groundwater often will will render those groundwater resources either unsuitable or un, unusable. But also, um, I think there's a as a great opportunity uh, to think from a systems approach, uh, particularly the use of natural systems, be it wetlands or ways to to improve water quality for recharge. So, you know that that would seem to to be an area. Um, particularly given the similarity of some of our climates, that would be really useful to to think about collaboration. On. I think uh, groundwater education is a key thing. You know, yes. we need data at a village level that people can understand what is happening and what can they do. So, sort of empowering them and really making part of the management equation. And the second thing I was thinking between Australia and India, Australia has, has a very good land care program. And that, that's a community driven. Yeah. And I think something we can learn, there might be, you can't transfer, but there are some lessons there, which can be like a groundwater care type thing where community can get together and uh, uh, how it was started, and it's a very successful program, I would say. So there, there, there can be some crossovers there. Uh, two more areas which comes to my mind are basically the one uh, Peter Dillon has started long back, the use of uh, this um, sewage water for recharge, and uh, now government is promoting the uh, domestic sewers uh, uses in the in the agriculture irrigation use so uh, we are in process of formulating some standards so that the uh, water which is uh, uh, domestic sewage water that can be used for uh, irrigation purposes so i think we can have a uh, uh, this group we can uh, the we can take up this group opportunity and to uh, pitch in, in that and prepare the standards uh, the the standard of the water that can be used for irrigation that is one thing and second thing is uh, for the uh, rejuvenation of the rivers we have uh, demarket started demarketing the springs initially we have taken pilot study in the northern part but see most of the uh, rivers in the southern part of india are groundwater fed so there also we need to take care of the springs so there is a need to prepare a protocol and documentation how to go ahead with the protection of the springs and rejuvenate the springs and definitely it cannot be taken uh, with the help of government we need to involve the uh, public and uh, there need to be a, a capacity building in those area because springs are basically left alone and uh, not much uh, attention has been given in the past and those are the source of water for the perennial uh, this uh, for the continuation or the availability of the springs of the, of the river so those these two things uh, comes to my mind which i think uh, we can include in our this discussion that how we can use the uh, the domestic sewer water for irrigation purpose 
what should be its standards yeah. and second one how can we save or rejuvenate our springs so as to maintain the eco flow in the uh, river system fantastic thank you i'm just noting we have 4 minutes left so i might just move us on to the second question which is how do we initiate and sustain significant collaboration between australia and india for research training and capacity building in groundwater and and um, we can discuss this in regard to engagement across all sectors with researchers ngos and um, public and private sector alex the decision was we're just focusing on one question. Oh, there's the one days. question. I apologize. Sorry. So yes, first, four, first four rooms are one question, first question, and oh, then I rest. I apologize. Is. That's okay. But uh, if people want, we can discuss second question. Doesn't harm. Or further discussion of first. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe it's a time to take second question. <laughs> uh you mean to say uh, how long we have gone with this partnership well well how do we um how do we continue the this partnership do you have ideas around how we could initiate and sustain that collaboration between the different sectors you know researchers etc and public private oh, yeah, sector sure, sure. ngos yeah sure <clears throat> uh, i think they between, between australia and india how of course, of course. Yeah. how we can uh, make it more more strong and more, give it to strength yeah and sustain uh, <clears throat> there are few things which has come in recent past like the land land subsidence issues are recently been identified near delhi near calcutta and uh, two three places more so i think uh, uh, that part is important we need to uh, we need to have a studies on that and we are promoting uh, so we can have a, some joint studies on the land subsidence issues due to the over exploitation of groundwater, especially in urban areas. That can be one. Other can be we can have a um, program on climate change studies because on groundwater, very few study has been taken up how the groundwater will be affected due to the changing pattern of rainfall. So I think few study has been taken up by the NIH, uh, but not to the extent that a course model type of thing has come up from for whole of the India. Or maybe like the we are having four five type of agroclimatic zones. So for different agroclimatic zones, what are going to be the condition post climate change? So that can be one other area of the uh, research. And the other part is the. Uh, the developing the protocol for the water ingress in the coastal areas. Uh, then, uh, in case of trainings, trainings uh, under the Marvi, we had a MOU, but we could not actually go ahead much beyond that. Uh, we need to enforce that the we we try to uh, do the exchange of faculty between the Australia and uh, the Rajiv Gandhi Training Institute located in, in uh, Raipur. So uh, we have got a good faculty at uh, Raipur, but we need the expertise of the Australian counterpart to have an exchange program on various modules as well as the, uh, the expertise of the faculties. Uh, uh, we also like to have the uh, preparation of module by the both the parties joined together so that those modules can be adopted here. One more thing we are like to have the water audit has been made mandatory throughout the India under the regulation of groundwater. So uh, I think the time is going yeah. to very so soon. The, now. I think the other thing is I just wanted to uh -huh. note. So I just wanted to close that. Yeah. That water audit is an important thing. We need to prepare a module on that. We can also have a collaboration in that part. Yeah. And also more event like this to networking, knowing each other sharing experiences. Yes, I, yes, sure. When, when we know each other, then I think things follow. Yeah. And I'll just flag the, the opportunity with leadership programs, be that early career researchers, um, looking at the leaders of our future, how we might connect them together so that they can build 
a network between Australia and India working in similar areas. We've had a great deal of success um, with some of the early career researchers that have had an opportunity to come to Australia and be mentored, um, and, and we see that could be. Um, so let's just do a we've got 15 minutes. Um, so my name's Rebecca. I'm in Australia. I work for the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. So my role here is to work on um, work with the states together managing the Great Artesian Basin. So that's the largest groundwater system in Australia that stretches from all the way up in Queensland, the uh, top peak of Australia, all the way down in the, to the central. So if we've got uh, just a really quick whip around the room, if you can just introduce yourself and where you're from, and then we'll launch into the first question. Okay. Um, I'm Narsimha Reddy, uh, uh, working in the Western, uh, in Western Sydney University School of Science. Uh, I've not done much research with uh, water, except that uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Basant Maheshwari is my close friend. But uh, I work in the area of basically science, protein, natural protein and natural carbohydrate food security, uh, like uh, functional foods um, based on uh, protein uh, rich foods as well as polysaccharide uh, uh, rich foods like lupin research and all we did. Uh, so that may be uh, useful for my expertise, may be useful for the next part of uh, uh, the workshops like food security aspect. Uh, but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to listen to you and I've got a couple of questions uh, on uh, water use as well, natural water use at a later time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Karen Barker. I'm from the Australia India Institute, and actually, I'm a bit of an imposter because I'm not a water expert by any means. Um, so I'm really here just to um, to listen uh, and um, hear what everyone has to say. Thanks, Karen. Um, my name is Archit. Um, I'm interning with the Australia India Institute, uh, and work I work with Karen. Uh, similar to Karen, I'm just here to, for some administrative reasons and to listen in and learn. I'm a student at the University of Melbourne as well, um, and I'm studying sustainability science. Um, so all the research uh, that has been talked about and will be talked about in the next part would be really great for me to listen to. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ashit. Hi, I'm Srini uh, from NHP, National Hydrology Project. I'm working as a capacity building expert, so that's why I'm very happy to join you all and to listen to you. So. Thank you. From the CEO of DB. I don't know whether you're able to hear me. I'm not able to see myself. I think video is uh, some issue in the video. Are you able to hear me? It's a little bit faint if you can. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Suresh, Regional Director, Central Groundwater Board in Faridabad. I work in the artificial recharge uh, projects in the board. You're welcome, thank you. I'm, I'm Jay Pantaki. I'm with EcoSeal. I'm a, a consultant and researcher in groundwater, and I work mostly in Australia, based in Australia, and I work in um, East Asia and South Asia. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Is anybody that doesn't have a camera on like to uh, introduce themselves to the room? You've got a lot of uh, listeners observers on this one, Rebecca. <laughs> we do. Let's move on to um, the conversation topic. Uh, I'm just going for the, for a quick time. So the first question is, what are the key issues, challenges and opportunities related to groundwater research, training and capacity building in both Australia and India over the next five to 10 years? There's a lot in that question. Um, 
does anyone want to start us off with their thoughts, uh, perhaps in their, their country of expertise, either in Australia or India to start with? The first point I feel is like uh, the ownership. In groundwater, nobody is the owner. Right? And everybody is the owner. So that has to be somewhere monitored and then regulated. Because still we are governed by the Eastman Act of 1882. Unless until something is done by that, it will be difficult for us to give the ownership. Because when you say the collective ownership, Nobody is responsible because it is everybody's uh, Anybody can and uh, they can use it. So there should be some sort of uh, moderations of the ownership of the groundwater. There should be some legal framework in that. Yeah, that's a really interesting challenge. Um, in Australia, uh, groundwater is, is owned by entitlements in a, in a similar way surface water is. So um, the fact that India doesn't have groundwater ownership exclusively, um, I find very confusing. And, and I, I'm, it's a huge, huge issue to start with and, and challenge it there. Are there any other opportunities related to that? Are there any benefits? the fact that nobody owns the groundwater? Yeah, like uh, suppose the river. So the river, you have ownership of the state. They share the water, everything there. Whereas groundwater is, uh, there is like uh, no ownership or anything. The rivers belong to the government and then states have the this thing. Whereas in groundwater, it is it's not uh, owned by the government or anybody. It is owned by everybody. So I have... Uh, the water, groundwater beneath my land is mine. I can take out. So yeah, I think one of the, I think that's correct. One of the challenges is how do you govern uh, the commons, basically? Groundwater is a common property. So how do you govern that? And the work by Elena Ostrom um, was groundbreaking in which she said that uh, basically uh, you, if you have many, many users with diverse interests and you know, um, there are constraints on managing it just by regulation. And you really need stakeholder involvement in co-developing an understanding of how you will share this common property. How will you share this resource? So I think um, that although uh, it presents many challenges, I think that's an opportunity. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, you're just on, on mute there. If you're trying to, to in Australia, who owns the water, groundwater? In Australia, who is the owner of the groundwater? The state? So the... In Australia, water ownership is what they call unbundled from the land in most most states. Uh, there are some areas in Australia where uh, the land you own, there'll be a water entitlement associated with that land ownership. But in most cases, you can own water entitlements without owning land. Groundwater is a little bit unique in that uh, in most spaces, you need a bore to access that groundwater, and drilling those bores is quite expensive and costly in maintaining those bores. So there's uh, people will own entitlements, and if there's a high demand for a particular resource, a particular aquifer, uh, they can often trade the water entitlements between um, the people that have that bore to access it. Uh, there's other areas such as the Great Artesian Basin where the groundwater pressure is so high that there are bores that are dug down so deep 
into the high pressure confined aquifer that then become free flowing. And one of the big um, policy things we're working on at the moment is working with the states to cap those free flowing bores because we're finding that the artesian pressure in those aquifers is declining um, and it's been declining over the past 15 years. So once that water is then free flowing across the surface, a lot of the time it's dug into trenches and into, um, into wetlands or out over agricultural properties. Um, but the actual ownership is, is an individual entitlement um, and has been based on um, for most aquifers, it, there's a there's a way of working out the sustainable yield or how much water can be sustainably taken out in a, in a year without um, damaging the aquifer or changing the water quality, and that the entitlements will be issued up to that limit. And I think I think another thing is that Mr. Nanda Kumar mentioned that uh, there's this increasing pressure on groundwater because of increasing populations, and uh, that's something that many countries are faced with, and so that's a significant challenge because uh, you've got a diminishing resource, you've got in increasing demand, and so how do you manage that sustainably? And I think that's a real challenge, and also. May, probably an opportunity for greater research and work between our two countries. Uh, sir, coming back to your uh, this thing, what Dr. Nandakumar told us, right stress on the groundwater is increasing. That is because there is no control. Basically, surface water, the river water is flowing. Everybody wants to take the water. They have to have the, take the permission from the authority. You cannot just take the water. Whereas in case of groundwater, everybody has uh, this thing, open uh, this thing, key. Do you, do you feel that licensing yeah. and capping the number of people that can access and solve that and solve some of the other sort of increased demand issues, or will they stay? So they're coming back to this thing again, the, unless and until that ownership part is uh, this thing, at least the rights, because sugar water, if some states want to take more water, they are the bipartisan state has to take, uh, they have to take uh, permission from the downstream states. Whereas in groundwater, there's nothing like that. Nobody takes permission from anybody. So the, unless and until accountability is brought in, it will be very difficult to manage. The stress will continue. What do you think the first steps are to working towards an ownership model in India are? Because still I am uh, not very clear what you gave a reply for the Australia because a uh, couple of my friends are also working in Australia. They used to tell me that they, whenever they want to take water, they want to drill a well, they take permission from somebody. Then the authority gives a permission for drilling a well. First they uh, drill a well and see them, tell them how much you can uh, pump and uh, what is the quantity you can pump. Then they go for marketing the water. So that means they are getting revenue also from them. But they take permission from that and they pay some money, uh, some sort of uh, this thing, payment is made to the government or uh, whatever is the authority, saying mm -hmm. that I'm going to use this much of groundwater for which I'll be paying this much money. So Absolutely. somebody. Is but but just before you get to having a system in place, so what is you, is what is usual? The, it is the government. But what is the first step to actually getting the people that access the water currently for no fee? How do you bring them on board to engage in that permission seeking and fee paying model? Currently, they're getting a resource for free. How are you going to get them to pay for it and ask permission? To me, that seems like the first challenge. I'm, I'm, I might ask a question, um, which uh, might um, uh, get an answer in that area. So um, from my understanding in India, it's very easy to find those summer sepals and bow wells um, that you know farmers and even households um, are able to install for relatively low cost. Um, and access a lot of groundwater um, and dig it out of, uh, for free, uh, essentially. 
um, if we were to regulate that machinery and how widely available it is, uh, maybe we could. Uh, it would be a good starting point um, to to stop encouraging uh, people um, to access groundwater so heavily in in a wasteful manner. Would would that be something that might work from an Indian perspective? Because the same thing was tried about a couple of decades back, mm -hmm. sometime in the early 90s. We started uh, asking the industry, I mean, uh, drilling companies, drilling rigs to register. But uh, we, it, I don't think it was a successful uh, decision. There were some issues and uh, there was a lot of duplication and the records are pretty difficult to register. What I would uh, suggest is more of a cooperative uh, because groundwater is mostly taken about 85% of the groundwater is used for the agriculture purposes. And uh, regulating agriculture is a very sensitive issue. It will be very difficult also to do it in India. So what unless the people understand the precarious nature of the groundwater system, once it is depleted or contaminated, going to, you are going to be in a soup. Till that gets into their mind, it will be very difficult for the people to do it. Like even the successful participatory groundwater management, wherever they have done it, the first successive models, everywhere, the people have been taken into confidence and the people have made the decisions. Yeah, look, we're running, uh, we've got a minute left. Does can anybody I, else have anything they'd like to add? Yes, yes, please. Uh, can I ask a general question, please, uh, which uh, the experts here may be able to help? I know one of the, a well, couple of South Indian yeah. states, uh, I know a couple of yeah. South Indian states where they lift water from uh, rivers, lift irrigation scheme, uh, during the rainy season, when the water excess water is flowing into the seas, they lift water to highlands. Uh, I mean, basically with large pumps, and uh, they have been able to. They have been successful in irrigating uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares of land with this uh, method, um, where water is uh, of enormous shortage. Actually, even the groundwater is not there. And now with those reservoirs lifted, basically water is lifted into those reservoirs um, quite far away. And from there, basically they may either use further lifting or gravity methods to irrigate uh, their lands. And some of the water is used for drinking as well. And my, my question here is not only that the water that is lifted is being used where uh, basically the, the groundwater is short in highlands, those groundwater is recharged as well because of the storage of large quantity of water in the reservoirs. So what are your thoughts about this method being implemented in large scale uh, place? I think that uh, comes down to needing to understand the systems uh, on, a, on a local level and having appropriate accounting I mean, strategies to account for that. Can I give a reply to whatever the point he has raised is like this? Yeah. The mm -hmm. irrigation, lift irrigation, is not done as a big project, even it's done as a small project. Small, small pumps are kept in the small points where they irrigate, say, probably 25, 50 hectares of land collectively, and for which they take permission for taking this one. And some states have a separate department for this, like in Orissa, where I used to work about two, three, four, three decades back. There they had a Orissa Lift Irrigation Corporation. So they had the... I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to stop you there just because we're about to get pulled back to the main session. I just want to... ...organization you work for and what, what, what's interested you in coming to this workshop today. So I'll start with you, Rohit. Thank you. Actually, just saying, um, Mr. Kumar, we, we would like you to introduce yourself very briefly, 20 seconds or so, and um, if that's all right with you. Okay, okay. I'm Professor Rohitash Kumar. I am... Uh, Associate Dean at Sri Kashmir University of Agriculture Sciences and Technology, Kashmir. And presently, I am a visiting professor at uh, with Western Sydney University. Uh, okay. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Now, I'll move along my list. Um, Anupma Sharma. Yeah. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, I'm Anupma Sharma from uh, National Institute of Hydrology at Roorkee. Uh, it is located in Uttarakhand state of India, in the northern parts. Uh, I am working as a scientist in the Groundwater Hydrology Division for the last 25 years. Okay, nice thank you. Not. Thanks, Anupma. Um, Carleen Maywald. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Carleen Maywald. I'm um, currently um, appointed by the South Australian Government as the South Australian Water Ambassador. Uh, my background is, is political. I'm formerly the Water Minister for the Government of South Australia uh, and also formerly the Chair of the National Water Commission of Australia. Uh, and um, I'm also um, very much involved with the Australian India Water Centre with Baswant um, Maswari. Mm. And um, I've also um, had a long history in water reform management in Australia. Uh, and in South Australia, groundwater management has been critically important to us as it is everywhere. So I'm here mm. to, uh, to, um, to learn more about uh, groundwater management, um, to uh, provide some of um, the experiences that I've had in water management in Australia across surface water into transboundary water management through the Murray Darling Basin, major reforms yep. of water and introduction of um, um, water reforms in the policy area. And also a yep. big part of it has been community engagement, stakeholder engagement, yeah, involved yeah. in decision making. That's right. Well, I mean, I, I have the Murray Darling people literally across the, the way from me. And yes, it's all about um, well, it's not all about, but a large part of it is community community engagement, stakeholder engagement. Thanks, Colleen. And we're very lucky to have you here today. So thanks for joining us. Um, uh, oh, I'm actually also flying off to Adelaide in about an hour. So that's something I'm looking forward to very much. Yeah, I know. Back to Adelaide. It's lovely down there. Um, Miss uh, Dr. Dr. Tripathi, if you're there, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, a very good morning to all dignitaries. Myself, Dr. Pooja Tripathi. I am a research associate in Central Pollution Control Board. And uh, uh, is your research all on groundwater, Dr. Tripathi? Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, your research is on groundwater. Yes, sir. I am uh, actually I am associated with associated with National Hydrology Project and looking uh, okay. uh, working on surface water and groundwater both for both area I am working uh, on different okay. projects I am working. Yes. Sir. Excellent. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, okay. Well. Hindi, Hindi. I have one question. Uh, yes. I think uh, uh, groundwater monitoring system it should be effective and. Uh, mm. It should be suggest some uh, I means such type mechanism so effectively we can measure and uh, means uh, at more locations. Okay, I see. So that's essentially monitoring sensing, systems isn't it? should be effective. Okay, well, look. In that case, we'll we'll use that as the opening as the opening theme to bring into our question. Then, what are the key challenges and opportunities? related to groundwater in research, training, and capacity building for our two countries over the next five to 10 years. So if we're talking about the key challenges and opportunities, um, Associate Professor Kumar has just, um, Professor Kumar, sorry, has just uh, offered that reflection that groundwater mechanisms for monitoring groundwater and for making assessments in groundwater need to improve. Is that potentially an opportunity? So let's let's maybe look at what, what is the challenge there? Why, what is the existing state of play? How is data currently being collected in Australia as compared to in India to assess the state of groundwater resources? Does anybody have an answer to that question? I can probably start with that. Um, um, mm. Australia's done um, some work in this area and some large scale and some small scale area. But um, um, uh, Dr. Kumar is quite correct. You can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, and uh, the starting point for doing um, anything in, in the management of, of groundwater sources is actually understanding what's there, doing your appropriate groundwater mapping, and then also metering and monitoring um, those that are using water so you know where it's going and, and who's using it. Um, so so um, Australia has had a introducing metering um, of ground, mm -hmm. um, but also prescribing our groundwater resources. And the prescription of groundwater resources is, is about actually understanding what water's there, doing the mapping, doing the um, analysis and quantifying what the resource is, and then actually working to that 
what the capability of that resource is, is as, as far as a sustainable extraction level. And then moving to the other side of it is the, um, the user side is managing their take, how much they're taking and um, measuring and monitoring that to ensure it's within the sustainable limits that have been set. So there's a number of steps in that that um, Australia has gone through, but the first step is always to actually understand what your resource is initially. And then second step is to then put in place the processes to be able to manage that water um, through regulatory um, processes. And that also includes the, um, the metering and monitoring of the tank. So that would be if we were looking back to um, the first presentation we heard during the, the, the presentations phase, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about um, managing its, its supply level um, management, isn't that? It's essentially understanding the state of the supply, right? And that's... Um, yeah, it, there's two parts to it because that presentation mm. was an excellent present presentation that talked about technology and also talked mm. about governance. And there are two components to this as well. The first component is around um, what are, what are you um, and what do you need to know about the resource to start off with? Um, what what do, don't you know about the resource? What's what's the mm. research that you need to do to better understand um, um, the the capacity of the resource? Um, then you need to have in place um, the governance frameworks around how you're going to manage that. Well, I might you throw need to, to put in place. The... Have we lost a couple of our breakout room participants? I think we have. Yeah. I was going to throw to um, Dr. Tripothi because I think that um, that must be some some in some way linked to her research. But I'll I'll, I'll invite um, Anupma Sharma and Rohit Kumar to to make reflections on that. I think that the, the statement that you cannot manage what you can't, you cannot manage what you haven't measured, um, I think is quite apt. Um, how does this fit into the Indian context then in terms of the capability, whether it's technological or a governance framework capability to measuring, mapping, monitoring groundwater? Yeah, actually uh, in India, we have uh, basically it's a central groundwater board. Uh, which is doing the groundwater estimation. So we have uh, the groundwater estimation committee norms in place. And over the years, these have been, you know, updated regularly. And uh, they have come up with, uh, you know, with new uh, kind of uh, measurements and uh, lots of, you know, um, CGWB uh, locations are there, piezometers are located, which are mm -hmm. being monitored on regular basis, including the water quality. Uh, also, they have uh, installed a number of uh, AWLRs uh, along with telemetry uh, data that is being, you know, brought in into their uh, uh, database. And uh, besides that, uh, recently the government has initiated the NACWIM campaign where the aquifer mapping program is going on. So lots of data is being generated uh, also regarding the suitability of the aquifers about the artificial recharge. So what scope of artificial recharge is there? So all this is being done by CGWD. Uh, also, okay. uh, yeah, the type of, you know, the geological formations uh, which are present in different areas, like in Northern uh, parts of India, we have the Indo-Gallicus. These are very prolific aquifers. Uh, but in the Southern part, uh, three, uh, you know, uh, two thirds of India is covered by the hard rock region. So again, lots of, you know, monitoring work is going on there. Thank you, um, Anupma. Does anybody else have any reflections on that as well before we try to close up the first part of this question and move on to the second part? I'd just like to add one thing, and one, this is a mm. reflection on the Australian circumstance. Um, we yep. have yep. a whole range of, of um, um, groundwater mapping that's been undertaken at um, a very large scale. Um, and the thing that we have found um, to enable us to manage better is, is to actually get down to a much more granular approach to how mm. we, we map. Um, and um, we're not there yet. Um, there's um, some great new technologies coming out um, these days to actually be able to, to actually assess um, groundwater um, um, at that really granular scale. Mm. Uh, and we mm. find that um, a lot of our assumptions around groundwater at the large scale don't actually apply when you get down into the local area. Um, so so the, um, the management tools that um, we've used in the past for groundwater management constantly have to be um, 
you know, keeping pace with the new innovative technologies that are coming um, on board. And one of the things that I find is, is a big challenge for governments is actually understanding that you don't buy technology for life. You buy it for the time until the next lot of technology comes along. Right. And so how do you actually enable the water um, sector and the water decision-making to embrace new and innovative changes because it just mm. costs more and more money to do that. Um, but if you're not embracing innovation, you're making decisions based on old information. Um, so, yeah. so in Australia, we struggle with how we actually find pathways for new innovative technologies to come to market and to actually be used out in the field. Um, there's a lot of research in this area. There's a lot of new technologies out there that just aren't being taken up. So the question is, why not? What's actually the blockages? Yeah. Why aren't those technologies being taken up? And, uh, and why is it so difficult um, to, to get new technologies to market? Can I can I use this idea of these of new innovative technologies, things, uh, you know, innovations that are developed that are fit for purpose, that are uh, that are clearly ahead of it or ahead of the the existing um, infrastructure or innovations that are in place? Um, I'll use that idea and the idea that there's challenges in, in challenges in bringing them into the into the into practice to move into the second question. And the second question is how do we initiate and sustain and it's not about necessarily initiating and sustaining embracing technologies, but it's about initiating and sustaining. How do we initiate and sustain significant collaboration between Australia and India for whether it be research or training or capacity building and groundwater? So I might start, because I've still got you here on the screen, Kali, I might start with you in terms of uh, Australian and Indian collaboration on these kinds of innovative technologies. Where do you see the scope for collaboration there? Is it in is it in um, is it in the trade sector or is it in the is it right back down at the research level and the, the academic level? What do you think about that? Well, I think the barriers for for being able to effectively collaborate um, is is um, com comes down in the in the technical side of things. Both mm. the, the Australian government and the Indian government and those statutory authorities that run water are largely very conservative in the way in which they approach um, procurement policies and the like. Um, so therefore, right. the ability to be able to tap on the door of a major utility with a brand new um, shiny widget that's been invented mm. by a partnership of, of um, um, innovators in universities is really, really difficult because both in Australia and in India, there's, there's some really old traditional ways in which procurement occurs. Uh, and so we don't have the opportunity for um, test beds, for example, where new yeah. technology can be um, trialled at scale in working situations. And often the, the requirement for the industry um, who has developed the technology is to do all of the hard yards um, and to do all of the pilots and provide all of their input and all of it and do it all mm -hmm. for nothing and hope that there'll be a sale at the end of it. And that happens mm -hmm. in and I know it's, I've also experienced it in India as well. And so having that opportunity to actually accelerate pathways for innovation to get to the market so it can be taken up by the purchasers, which are generally governments uh, or government mm -hmm. statutory authorities, is That's a real right. so, so I think the collaborations between um, Australia and India can work on well, what are those pathways to actually increase the, the ability for us to uptake the new technologies that we're working on. The other thing is with universities, there's always the cost centres of universities that create a bit of tension when you're developing mm. the research um, partnerships and collaborations. And so we need to we need to work on new and innovative models in that in that collaboration space between universities to make it worth the while of universities on both sides to actually mm. enter into collaboration partnerships because often often there's good intent, but what might happen is that the um, the university may see, well, whilst there's good intent and there's good knowledge, there's not enough in it for me as a university. And so the, the partnerships don't um, don't end up being realised. So that's also mm. a challenge. Thanks, Carleen. We, we, yeah, we're out of time. I wish we had more time. I think it's going to cancel us out now. Okay, it will close in 60 seconds. Considering we've got 55 more seconds, I'll just get a final comment from you as well. Yeah, I would like to say that, okay, uh, uh, maybe we can think of having some joint studies. The, but the problem is that even if we, you know, uh, do come up with some successful case studies, uh, bringing mm. it and popularizing it among the masses 
that is again a big issue. Like in India, uh, we are having utilized for you know irrigation and uh, mm. lots of pumping is taking place. So, but uh, that involves changing the cropping pattern because we are lots of farmers are going in for water intensive crops. So again, right. changing the mindset is very important. Uh, okay, but, yeah. yeah uh, it's that, it's that attitude shift, but that's that relates to what Carleen said as well about the gov government on a government level as well as in a university or a joint studies level. It's an authorizing environment that's going to enable this, whether it's in a university or whether it's in the government. So, okay, we might might move on. So we um, are addressing the first question, which uh, is around what are the key challenges and opportunities related to groundwater uh, research in research training and capacity building. For Australia and India over the next five, 10 years. So what I thought I'd do initially, oh, a few more people coming. So um, so what I thought I'd do initially is uh, I'm moderating the room. Um, so I'd love someone to be able to be note taker or and report back when we report back. There'll probably just be a minute or two to report back what, what was discussed, uh, what was discussed in this room. Um, does anyone want to put their hand up for that? <laughs> Happy to do that. If, if that would be great, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I think, think to a large extent, I think given time and that sort of thing, we'll probably only have a a few a few minutes to uh, it when we report back, just to report the key, um, uh, I guess, discussion points more than anything else. So that would be great. I thought maybe for the first minute or so, we've still, we can keep an eye, we've got 17 minutes still. Um, just introduce ourselves, my, back, my background, my name is Ricky Spencer, I'm at uh, Western Sydney University. Um, my back, background is in ecology and um, uh, freshwater uh, biodiversity conservation. So that's where I come from, not strictly around groundwater, that sort of thing. So um, that's where I mainly come from. Uh, Srikanth, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Srikant. Um, I'm from CSIRO Land and Water from the Water Security Program. My background is in groundwater hydrology, primarily groundwater modeling, uncertainty analysis kind of work, and based in Brisbane. Thank you. And Peter, I'll put it over to you, but we, we've learned a lot about you and what you do over the last uh, 20 minutes or so, but a brief introduction would be great. Yeah, I used to work with CSIRO and uh, I'm, I'm involved in managed aquifer recharge and water, groundwater quality protection. Thank you. Uh, pretty, how are you? Pretty? Maybe you'll go to, is it Tejas? Uh, pretty's in the, in the discussion. Mic not working? I'm audible. No, you're not. Uh, yeah. You're, you're, you're mute. Just got to hit the mute button, pretty. Mm, okay. What about, is it TJS? Hello. We'll come back to you, pretty. Uh, TJS, did you want to introduce yourself? Tejas Monkeyker. I have done my MSc in Applied Geology from Bangalore University, which is in South India, and I have joined Central Groundwater Board as a groundwater hydrologist. Thank you. And, and I'm currently working on groundwater exploration, and I have interest in managed aquifer recharge as well as rock water interaction. Thank, Thank you for that. Um, so Pretty's having some issues uh, with the audio. Um, if you can hear us, I, th I think probably what might be the best thing for you, Pretty, is maybe just um, if you want a discussion point, we'll keep monitoring the chats and we can um, uh, put in there. Otherwise, maybe try and uh, jump out, restart it, or if, yeah, it, it, perhaps best just to uh, use the chat function in the discussion and I'll, um, I'll keep monitoring and, and, and raise it as well. So let's... Um, Let's kick it off. I might hand it to you, Peter. I guess you've, you've outlined quite a bit of the uh, the, the, the challenges, um, but 
I guess, what do you see as the key challenges and the potential for opportunities related to um, research? Uh, we say research first, but also training and capacity building is probably, um, uh, you know, how does that research, you know, I guess, tra get translated into that capacity building? If I had the answers, uh, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't be here. Uh, I think. Uh, what I've seen is that um, just as in just as in Australia, in India, academics have got very limited access to um, funding to enable measurements to be undertaken. And unless you've got the fundamentals in place, you know, if you if you can't do um, monitoring of uh, pathogens, for example, then how do you do a risk assessment? You're really stuck. So there needs to be some basic capacity building in the tools that are necessary in order to be able to do the risk assessments if you're going to do managed aquifer recharge with recycled waters. What you, should, what you could do, though, is make your targets the simpler targets initially using natural waters and start doing some measuring with the, uh, the, of the parameters that, that you can measure and gain experience doing that. And once you, once there's da, once there's some data coming in, and you can see how you can use the data, then it's possible to uh, move to the more advanced cases. I've, I've occupied too much time. Sorry. No, no, no that's absolutely. I think that's um, around the pathogen building uh, uh, monitoring concept is. Um, I think to a large extent it. Uh, it I think in Australia, it's certainly one aspect that it's the major aspect that's probably limiting um, uh, the, the use of recycled water uh, in Australia in terms of, you know, those, those uh, how that relates to risk. We're probably very good at monitoring, um, monitoring pathogens, at least to some extent um, or to some yeah. level. Um, I'm, I'm interested, Srikantha, did you want to jump in here and in, in terms of your um, the use of modelling, I guess, to some some extent, have you explored that in terms of that risk? In terms of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that. So, in, in terms of um, issues and challenges, one one particular thing that I was thinking about in terms of skills, for example, around modelling or or that kind of technical expert assistance, there there is kind of a uh, we need to bridge a gap in terms of research and development and application in, 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 in the field. For example, if we, if we, it, it, there's a lot of research capacity in India such around hydro, hydrological modeling, but largely in, in academic institutions um, and, and um, delivering that capacity into the into field scale applications, like in, in, in for example, in, in government institutions where, where um, the decision makers or managers are. Um, I think I think there is a, 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 a gap in the skill there. I mean, mostly people like modelers or engineers doing technical work are in academic institutions, and um, um, well, agencies like Central Groundwater Board are are equipped. They 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 do recruit a technical experts, but at 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 the other levels, like in in the state level or in the local self government there is a there, there is a, a a gap in that kind of knowledge where it is actually applied on a regular basis so that's that's one thing that i could think of um and 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 there is kind of um uh, the 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 capacity sit in in specific silos uh, for example, uh, there are many academic institutions like iits who who have very skilled um, people doing um, modeling or, or geochemistry or uh, uh, hardcore geology work. Um, uh, uh, but when it comes to kind of a large scale, like a Ganga basin or kind of a basin scale um, planning, um, uh, there is perhaps lack of coordinated effort to make that, that kind of things happen at that scale. That's great. Did any uh, to Jess or? Pretty, Tejas, did you want to uh, jump in here? And pretty certainly, please put some comments down if you if you've got any that you like to. Pretty, you seem like you might have your microphone working now. Did you want to jump in? 
maybe not. Um, I, can, can, I, can I just add something, please? Please, um, yeah. Um, to Srikanth's, um, we found that in the Mavi project, we were unable to do groundwater modelling in the traditional sense because uh, it was quite undulating terrain and the, um, the uh, surface elevation mapping, the topographic mapping that was available to us um, uh, was supposed to have a plus or minus uh, uh, half a metre uh, elevation. And we found that uh, in practice, it was actually about five. And we weren't able to be, to be able to produce maps. So using the ground, we had 250 wells with groundwater levels, but we couldn't use them to be able to produce a groundwater map across the catchment um, because the elevations of the, of the datum points were not um, sufficiently well known. So there, is, there are issues like that that occur in India that, are, that we don't, often experience in Australia. Um, and um, so there needs to be some effort, perhaps at um, CGWB level uh, uh, or at central level that can, can help with resourcing for ground truthing some of these things that would, would enable better tools to be available or to enable people to, to use um, um, satellite um, phones or something to be able to get their elevations in some in, in a way that um, would enable then groundwater modeling to take place effectively. Yeah, that goes back to your initial initial point of investing in better quality data uh, at a, uh, for, for, from the top from like a CGWP level so that like a pan Indian scale uh, investments could be done. I, get, I think that also leads on to um, what are the what are the commonalities and, and differences between Australia and India in terms of groundwater sustainability. I know in Australia we've got our challenges around um, drought and obviously uh, the extreme um, climate and cli climate changes, particularly in uh, southeastern Australia, where water can be quite limiting, although not quite at the moment. Um, but what are the you know what are the key challenges going forward, uh, particularly in India and those the the common I guess the the common challenges that we're both facing, and but the differences that make um, uh, I guess groundwater sustainability um, and looking into the future about uh, making uh, how we would make it sustainable more sustainable than what it currently is. Well, in terms of the commonalities, of course, we have the, the same kind of um, uh, uh, like a, the government system, like the, the federal and state government system, where, where the state governments are kind of responsible for um, water and, and groundwater and in general water management. And I think there is a, there is a policy efforts happening um, uh, similar to Australia to have kind of, um, when it comes to bigger river basin management, there is kind of an increasing federal government role in, um, in, in managing particularly interstate kind of um, water resources system like, like Murray Darling or, or there have been effort in India to, to um, uh, develop river basin plans. And um, I think the, the um, uh, uh, Parliament has uh, um, is is just debating a, a, a river basin planning uh, uh, legal instruments to be developed. Um, uh, other than that, in terms of um, uh, differences, of course, uh, th th there's a scale difference. Um, yeah. In, 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 in uh, driven by the uh, demography and population, so um, anything is kind of tenfold or hundredfold in terms of um, the challenges posed by practical management and, and, and um, the risks. Um, and also the seasonality and, and, and patterns of monsoons and um, the, the spatial and temporal availability of water um, mm. 
perhaps make it, I mean, in, in some cases, very similar in, in, uh, in, to Australia and in some cases very different from Australia with, with um, the monsoons uh, happening in a very uh, 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 distributed across a, a season where, and, and um, uh, drought prone in other seasons, yeah. yeah. Peter, do you have anything to add to, add to that? I think everyone has troubles with river basin management. Mm. Uh, not even the Murray-Darling Basin is immune, especially the Murray-Darling Basin. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, um, we would use probably different tools. Uh, we've been using economic tools only in Australia, and there are, there's been some limitations with those, particularly because of our fragmentation of uh, catchment management. And the terminology we use, for example, for, uh, uh, for carryovers, uh, it's almost impossible to get uh, to, to do water banking in the Murray-Darling Basin because while it's economic, while it will be beneficial, while you, could, you, you can't prove, while people are working on different definitions for carryovers, that you will not disadvantage someone. And, uh, and I'm sure the same applies in India. In, in India, you've, in, a, in the hard rock catchments, basically a handful of villagers can uh, control their own destiny uh, with water use. But when you get into the alluvial systems, then you need hundreds of thousands of villages to all cooperate together in order to be effective in, in managing your groundwater. So I think, uh, you know, there, there are places where it's going to be obvious to start. And if you start in the hard rock terrain, develop your, your uh, sociological tools, your, your monitoring arrangements and so on, so that farmers get their understanding, you, you can see those being effective. Um, and, and then the next step would be, how do you get across village cooperation and, and broader cooperation um, with the objective of having sustainable groundwater? And that I think is, a, is just, a diff, is just as difficult in Australia as, as it is in, in, in India, even though we've got economic tools. Uh, I don't think those tools would have a chance of working in India. Yeah, and I think, um, so I think TJ uh, brought up in the chat, major problem for obtaining validated groundwater level data is that one has to approach departments across state and central governments and there is a lot of red tapeism and procedures to be followed. Yeah. Um, so a lot of data is also censored as well. Um, so I don't, how does that relate in Australia too, I guess, in terms of... Um, uh, I think it's probably, you, you see very different east of the divide and west of the divide with that too. But um, do, does anyone, Peter, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, we, we have a national water initiative and that brought at a high level an agreement to share information and, and fr freely share water information, groundwater and surface water. Um, so that's something that, uh, could be, perhaps be looked at uh, by, uh, if TJAS is with CGWB, perhaps uh, put it up through his organisation, that that's the sort of approach that uh, could be used, whereby uh, we, we had a ground, national groundwater I'm just, committee. Com I'm, I'm just going to, we got six seconds left. I think we might be kicked out there, but that, I think that's a really important point there. Um, so... We've got 58 seconds before we have to. Did you want to finish finish off there, Peter? Sorry about I that. I just really yeah. quickly groundwater. Uh, we had the state and groundwater national co uh, committees that that formed together and they agreed on things uh, hmm. together. And maybe that's something that the CGWB could do to, with the state uh, groundwater departments to bring them together into the same room to to manage that. Great. Um, if there's nothing else to add, I think we might. It should have a link going uh, to leave the breakout room. I think that when um, the discussion is going to go on, uh, just to you know feedback through camp, thank you for doing that. 
please use the chat function if you want to add stuff to, and um, uh, that'll all be captured as well. So, all right, I appreciate it. And thank you for your talk too, Peter. Uh, great talk and great to, uh, to hear about that. So we're about to be kicked out now. So bye-bye. <laughs> okay, well, how about we start talking? Would somebody, um, Dr. Mcnanda Kamara, you offered some really good technical information about the issues. Would you like to um, to start about some of the um, ways to initiate to sustain the collaboration? Pardon, your voice was not very clear. Um, how do we initiate and sustain collaboration with regard to research, training, and capacity building? So some of the projects that uh, the Marvi projects and the, um, some of the projects Peter Dillon talked about, how do we get collaboration in terms of this research, training, and capacity building? See, as far as the, the research is concerned, I suppose we need to have collaborative research on how to increase the efficiency of groundwater use in the country. Because our present efficiency, as far as I understand, is hardly uh, 45, uh, 30 to 40%, something like that, as far as water is concerned. Groundwater, of course, is a little more. But there is a lot of uh, scope for further developing technologies for reducing the water use mainly for irrigation and even for uh, domestic and other purposes industrial uses for making for developing benchmarks etc and uh, as far as training and collaboration is concerned that is definitely what uh, is the prime requirement is to encourage community participation in groundwater management, like you are already doing in Australia, especially in the Murray Darling Basin and all, where you have got the water markets and other things. Probably India is not ready for a water market sort of setup yet, but still that can be the end result. If people really know about the value of water and try to consider it as an economic good. So that is my take on that. Right, thank you. So yeah, you've said a lot of scope in developing technology, encourage community involvement and helping people to see the value of water. Thank you. Somebody else like to add, how do we initiate and sustain the collaboration between Australia and India with research, training and capacity building? Excuse me, I would like to add one more point in uh, Peter's presentation. He was talking about managed aquifer recharge, mainly using wastewater. Yes. The problem, one of the problem in India for that is the social acceptance. So, because people are not ready in spite of telling them that it is as good as clear water, good water, they are still having the feeling that it is still wastewater. So that mindset that has to change actually and what he was telling is that this water should not be used for drinking or domestic uses that is not very much practical as of now in, in the country because water resources if it is good for irrigation people think that it is good for domestic and drinking purposes also so that could be another uh, topic for capacity building or uh, awareness creation rather yeah, so how, what, have you thought about how that could happen? How could that awareness or how could that understanding happen? What type of activities would need? Would it need? How, did, how do you change the mindset? That is probably the technology of this MAR using wastewater should be taken to the people and they should be convinced that it is, it is uh, that water is perfectly fine to use for whatever purpose it is intended to. Okay, we'd like to go next. Uh, sir, uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. 
हाँ राजा प्यारे हाँ सर ऑडिबल ओके सर सर एंड गुड आफ्टरनून अतिन एंड गुड आफ्टरनून सर सर माय क्वेश्चन इज लाइक व्हाट कोलैबोरेटिव वर्क वी कैन डू लाइक इंडिया एंड ऑस्ट्रेलिया फॉर इंस्टिट्यूट इमिडिएशन ऑफ वाटर contamination like suppose we have lots of contamination in the indo gangetic plain and the brahmaputra bethna plain lots of arsenic are there fluoride is there so in situ remediation what type of thing what type of new technology we can uh, do for the in by collaborating with australia and india so that uh, like on the on the spot we can uh, rectify or mitigate the contamination sir Is that work not currently happening? So, is the research happening on identifying and, and um, mitigating contamination? Well, this is work that needs to happen. That is, you mean to say pilot projects in the field? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some pilot project in the field, like. Uh, suppose we have the wastewater treatment plant, primary treatment, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment. Everything is here. But uh, on the on the on the well itself, on the tube well or dug well, whatever, so we can do it in situ uh, treatment or remediation is there. Then it will benefit the local population, sir. If such type of technology we can develop, it is also uh, like not costly but cost effective treatment. If we can the Like uh, invent or something like, we can come up with such type of institute uh, treatment, remediation treatment will be very good, sir. The way you got what she is telling, she is talking about development of technologies for in situ remediation of quality issues, especially yes. with reference to wastewater. Are you able to type that up in the chat box and send it to me? Because I I don't want to miss that. Okay. Yeah, Radha Pere, you can just put it in the chat box and send to her. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, sir. So we've still got nine minutes to go. How about some of the other participants? What would you like to say about how do you initiate to stay in this collaboration? Do we want to refer back to um, Peter Dillon's? He talked about training. So, what type of um, how do you initiate training with researchers or the public or the private sector? What type of things would give people incentives to do training? I guess, well, I'll add my content then from working with Dr. Maharshi Reeds, just seeing the case studies and the examples, I think is a, is a really good way to promote continued work. And having worked with him for, for many years, I just hear people talk about being involved has changed them. When people get changed, they tell somebody else. So it's promoting the benefits um, of being involved in projects. And showing showing the examples. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so if you do think of something, then you can please write it to me so we can report back. Are, are people familiar with the Marvi project? Any examples? Were you familiar with this before today's presentation or the mention of this? Pardon? Were people familiar with the Marvi projects to manage aquifer recharge using village? Yeah, um, that is that is being done in a very small area. There is no need to scale it up actually. Scale up the Marvi project. Yeah, scaling up Marvi project probably first time I was mentioning about the Adal Bhujal Yojana. Those areas it can very well be piloted so that the scaling up happens on its own. Yes. Right. I guess 
What about funding? How's funding availability for people getting involved in research and training capacity? That, there, there should be probably there should be a dialogue between the Australia and the Australian and Indian governments on the basis of the MOU which has been signed. Actually, there has been some efforts between Central Groundwater Board and uh, Marvi for some time, but that did not happen actually. So it's ongoing, isn't it? Yes. So funding always gets people talking and thinking and <laughs> wanting to get involved. Funding available. We still have six minutes left. I have there's two people we haven't heard from or seen. So would you like to send a, a point or add something? A question you may have. Do you have a question about um, research and training? Do people like going to training courses? What would attract people to attend training to learn about things? Areas for training and collaboration. Yep, along the Navi lines, yes. And there's good information available on Navi and I've seen some booklets that are available and um, a lot of case studies too. People talking yes. about being involved in Navi has been had some other benefits as well. No, we have visited Mavi along with uh, Dr. Maheshwari and all the people we know how the people have benefited there, but it needs to be upscaled actually. It's in a very small area in a particular geographical uh, setting. So this should be applicable in other places also with minor variations. What else helps people to do training? to get involved in capacity building. We've talked about funding, we've talked about um, understanding, seeing the benefits for it, seeing the value, also the social acceptance. There's a lot of scope and community involvement. So how do we get more community involved? Or wanting to be involved? Because if there's people jumping up and down saying we want this, other people have to pay attention. So this is a good result. What else could, what else help, needs to happen? Sir, uh, sir. Hello, sir. Oh, hello. Huh? Uh, sir. Uh, sir, there are research projects, R&D projects working with IIT and uh, Australian uh, universities or institute. Is there any scope for the R&D with Central Groundwater Board and uh, other institute with uh, Australian uh, Institute? Like only R&D will be doing with the institute only, sir, like this, sir? It is possible because we have already got an MOU with uh, Australia. So in under the ambit of that uh, MOU, probably it must be possible. You can just put it in the chat box and send to her. It can be discussed, of course, because okay. this is for that purpose only. Yes, sir. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Well, we have one of our speakers here. Maybe you have a direct question for him. So we'll, well, I have a question then. How long does it take people to understand that the value and accept if we to use wastewater? Is it a time thing or is it hearing that other is examples? A, that is the biggest issue. That has not happened actually. Because people still feel that water is a free commodity. The economic cost of water is not understood by the people. Right from taking that water from the ground and supplying it to their doorstep, that has not come in actually. 
can you put a dollar value? Can a dollar value be put on, such as, you know, if we spend $1 only the here, structure is actually only a marginal value is being charged wherever it is being charged. Otherwise, it is completely free. So anything that is free, it, it is definitely it has to be wasted. That is what is happening. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to understand that dollar value is something if it's currently free and when you're in drought, you're desperate for it. When it rains a lot, you don't really care, do you? It's only a short-term thing. Mm. Okay, anybody else have any other questions or statements? Ah, Already right, some work is going on actually because probably it can be taken up under the ambit of this uh, Indo-Australian collaboration. Because that is stuck somewhere actually, because it is with the, in the consider in consideration of the government. Already, national water mission is uh, is taking up that, but it has not progressed well. Probably that can happen with uh, because you are already doing it. You have got a branding of uh, washing machines and other things already there in Australia. Yes. So this could be one good initiative which will have a long lasting impact. Fantastic. Okay. All right. I see we've got four seconds to go. I want to thank you all for your participation. Oh, we've got I think it's closing 57 seconds. So would anybody like to present that or you're happy for me to share that and copy your notes? Because this is being recorded, so all this information will be mm -hmm. part of the um, project and um, several of us will be writing these notes up. So any other last comments? No, that's all what I have now for the yeah. moment. All right, thank you, Dr. Nanda Kumar. All right, we'll see you back in the big room. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Some of the Indian some of the Indian researchers are um, again bottom up. Uh, approach can be used in those scenario where young uh, professionals are mm -hmm. actually uh, coming over and spending some time in Australia and vice versa, because that mm -hmm. helps in uh, seeing how things are done, what are the issues. And um, I was fortunate to uh, have Pralad actually, he visited us for eight weeks. And mm -hmm. that was really a significant learning experience where he quickly picked up the things and now he is running the show uh, in India. So, mm. uh, and uh, doing water quality analysis. So I think uh, uh, we need that practical experience mm. and that comes with the exchange visits. Uh, 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 just one point and I'll let others speak. Thank you. Okay, so NGOs, including NGOs, yeah. Um, Okay, so any other uh, suggestions? Um, what about uh, funding? What do you guys think about funding? That's the key um, uh, <laughs> thing, you know, yeah. no matter what we do, funding, uh, so sustain. I think we need that funding, continuous funding or uh, uh, mm. available and then prioritizing it. Uh, use. Um, so I think uh, funding is a key, for, no matter what we do, even exchange visits would require funding. Yeah, yeah. But how do we grow the funding? So, you know, um, um, what are the avenues, I suppose, you know, so what, um, what, what do you guys think about um, you know, where can we get, I suppose? Uh, so here uh, we can uh, uh, we can seek government help, we can seek project help, and here also we can, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned, that uh, we should start with the young generation. So we can ask for planning, we can ask for ex uh, expected budget, 
So we can uh, ask for that investment uh, investor. Mm. So that so you're talking about private investors? Yes, sir. Not only private investors, like the government is also there. We can uh, seek help from government also. But for continuous funding, uh, we should uh, not only depend on government. Mm. And uh, I guess uh, private uh, companies uh, as well, I suppose. Yes, sir. Yes. Mm. So, Deepa, can you elaborate on it? Like from your experience, who are the uh, private yes, investors? Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, I just want to focus on, we are uh, uh, talking about that PPP model. Mm -hmm. uh, that PPP model not only working with uh, the private sector in print level, in investing pattern also, we should move to that PPP model. Mm -hmm. mm. So for that, you need to charge, yes. for that, you need to charge the users a quota, I suppose, yeah? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what about that training? You know, the, you know, you know, what kind of training can we sort of, um, um, build into it, and how who can provide the training? Um, and uh, how that can be sort of uh, sustained over a long period of time. So any ideas? I, um, I was looking at John probably to contribute based on his experience. John, would you I, like I, to? I was, I was just about to make a comment on this. Thank you. I mean, that's far as from your point. Can, can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can hear you, okay, John. Right. So, so my experience, we, we've had funding from ACR, Australian um, Agricultural Research Institution. Mm. Um, the World Bank has, has got a very large program for groundwater management. It's total with the Indian government of nearly a billion dollars. Uh, the Australian government, I know, DFAT and so forth are also supporting all this. So uh, just getting back to Anu's point about sustaining this arrangement, essentially what I found from ACR and Australian Water Partnership and so forth, they like to fund projects where they can export some of their ideas, but they also want to import ideas so they can brag about it. I mean, we have to think about what are they trying to achieve. It's not just finding money. But they, they want, of course, good science, but they want to be able to brag about the output. So if I think about our experience in India and Australia, what Australia really offered, and Peter mentioned this before, this whole idea of water entitlements, allocations, and so forth, and how you actually apply that to a managed aquifer recharge system, that would be something that Australia could export. What India can export is this whole idea of collective, collective management, village-level management, which certainly is in, in deficit in Australia. And there's a growing interest about that. So it's actually trying to find particular topics, which are, I think you have this interchange of information but it actually appeals to fund it. Obviously, we have to meet their requirements, but it's also providing something more. What can they brag about? If they can brag about it, <laughs> then they're going to continue the funding. Then yeah. funders are just like us. I mean, you know, they're, they're not much different. We like to be able to you know, take some kudos and so forth. So that would be two areas that I would think about. That, that we, we, that would be entitlements for Harvey and manage that for recharge. And it's a very sophisticated notion that Australia has had Developed over many, many years of evolution. But then it's the sort of idea of, of, um, of bunker jankas and so forth, that the, the village champions um, mm. as, as the process of, of community science and this idea of collective management of common pool resource, which is very, made great, great strides in India, that could also then be exported back into Australia. So there you have a real interchange of information. That is valued by both parties. I mm. hope I haven't taken up too much time. Um, no, that's good. Um, you know, you sorry, you talked about the entitlement. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about exporting ma. I'm talking about the entitlements. It's called the robust separation of rights. How do you develop the rights for recharge? 
the rights mm -hmm. to recharge, the rights to recover that recharge, the, the licensing, whether it be an entitlement, whether it be, and for some areas that will apply. Mm. That will particularly urban settings. In rural settings, the collective management, I think, is certainly more appropriate. And that's what Australia would be looking at. What's the experience of India on collective management of managed aquifer recharge groundwater? And, as, and mm. India has much to offer on this. So what I'm saying is this interchange of research and information, which is valuable to both parties. Mm. It's, it's, it's bi-directional, it's not unidirectional. If you can do that, then you tend to appeal to what funding agencies are really looking for. Mm. Where do you think the MAVI approach can be uh, sort of applied in Australia? Uh, they're starting to look at it, absolutely. And also in Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. Mm. Where there's a lot of interest around this. Groundwater also hasn't been anywhere near as acute and, and um, as India, it's starting to get that way. So mm -hmm. groundwater resources have been exploited very quickly. And the Mavi approach has certainly been looked at by governments in Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, um, Vietnam. Okay, so we've got only 50 seconds left there. <laughs> um, Sorry, okay. I've taken up too much time. My apology. No, nah, it's all right. Anyone else? Uh, Basundara, you are there? So you want to say anything? Uh, you've got only 10 seconds left. 10, 20 seconds. No. Um, so, Nijesh, you want to say, you want to make any point? Mm. Professor Tanu, final words? Uh, I think pretty much gone on the words. I know any, anything else you want me to add? No? Um, it's all good? Yeah, okay. So we've got two seconds left. Okay. <laughs> Hello all. Um, I, I was assigned um, as moderator of this um, breakout group, so we'll take the initiative. Welcome all uh, to this breakout group. And um, I see we have uh, four, eight, uh, ten people. Okay, that's great. Great group. So let's start. And um, I think it would be nice to have a very short introduction. Um, and so I will introduce myself and then maybe we can go around the um, room and to um, know um, who is all in here. So I'm um, Oka Batlan. I'm a professor at um, Flinders um, University. And we have here a National Center for Groundwater Research and Training. My background is in hydrogeology and I'm uh, uh, one of the partners in the Australia-India Water Center. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead, yeah, Arup. Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, I'm Arup Kumar Sharma, professor in the Civil Engineering Department of IIT Guwahati. So I work basically on river engineering and of course watershed management, and that way some project towards these lines are going on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prachi? Uh, hello, good morning, sir. Myself, Prachi Gupta. I am a scientist in Central Groundwater Board, and my background is a hydrogeologist. Okay, thank you. Um, Russell? Uh, good afternoon, or good morning. Uh, Russell Rollison, I work with IceWarm, which has uh, focuses on capacity building training, and we've done some work in India in partnership with uh, other Indian organizations. And um, my background originally has been a geologist, but I've mainly worked in foreign affairs and spent three years based uh, at, at the post in New Delhi for Australia. Good, very good. Alok? Uh, hello, uh, good morning and good afternoon to Australian dignitaries. I'm uh, Dr. Alok Kumar Mayer. I'm working as a senior scientific assistant at Central Pollution Control Board, Delhi. And uh, basically, my background is uh, development of adsorption based technologies for drinking water purification. Okay, very good. Gopi? Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gopi Shankar from the State Government of Victoria, Australia, based in Bangalore. Um, 
I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not a water industry specialist, but I'm more of a generalist. Look at you know trade and investment opportunities between Victoria and India, including water sector. And great to be in touch with you again, Russell. Our paths have crossed after many, many years. Okay, good to know that people know each other already. Udesha, yeah? Uh, yeah, good afternoon to people from Australia and good morning to, to the people in India. Uh, myself, Uddesh Kumar, working as a hydrogenologist in Central Non Water Board, Ministry of Jal Sakti. And uh, simultaneously, this I am also enrolled in Young Water Professional Program. Uh, also, that's it. Thank you. Good. Roger? Uh, I'm Roger Packham, Associate Professor at the University of Western Sydney. I was a founding member of the Marvi uh, research team working in Gujarat and Rajasthan since 2012. I'm um, currently also helping out with the Young Water Professional uh, program, India program. Yeah, thank you. Panduram? Or is it? Yeah. Panduran? Pan we don't hear you. Um, must be muted. Uh, yeah, otherwise we go to Sushima, Shimina, sorry. Hi everyone, I am Sushmina Bajira. I am currently doing my PhD in precipitatory groundwater management in Gujarat and Rajasthan under Professor Basant Mysore. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Um, nice um, group that we have here with a lot of um, expertise. And um, let's um, immediately go to the question. We have um, less, maybe 10 minutes or so. So the, the question that we are invited to uh, discuss is how do we initiate and sustain significant collaboration between Australia and India for research, training, and capacity building in groundwater? Um, so yeah, let's let's open the floor. Um, who has some ideas how that could be um, developed, sustained uh, um, for researchers, NGOs, but also public private sector? Um, who would like to start? Um, before I, I I start, we start. Would there be what somebody willing to take some notes and to maybe report in the in the total meeting afterwards if there is time? Because maybe um, there is not much time. Who would be willing to write down a few notes? I, I'm willing, sir. Okay, I, great. That's much appreciated, Alok. Thank you. I'd like to suggest that one of the key things to, to develop um, a cooperative research programs is for people to get to know each other. Um, uh, and now we have this uh, wonderful Zoom uh, opportunity, so we're not flying around thousands of kilometers. Uh, we need to get a database together of um, active researchers in the area and their interest areas. Mm -hmm. Good suggestion. In fact, I mean, well, one thing we need to also kind of uh, do is visit, build visibility for the work that's happening in India as well as in Australia. In fact, the first session was actually very informative for me to understand, you know, how much of work is happening in India. Typically, all that you read is, you know, over exploitation with, you know, no recharge happening, uh, replenishment happening. But the fact that India is actually a leader. And the space is quite, um, you know, enlightening. We need to kind of, you know, build visibility of the work that's between happening between Australia and India, uh, so that I mean, once you kind of, you know, um, the academics come to know what's happening, say Indian academics understand what's happening in Australia, they would typically, you know, find ways of collaborating. Currently, what we need to bridge is the information gap between the two countries. That would be a first step to, you know, uh, start developing some uh, conversations and engagements. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I do fully agree with uh, Mr. Gopi Sankar uh, that what the works that are going on in Australia or in our side in India, uh, we can first share those work in some platform, may not be speaking even in writing form if we share those things, 
then it will be clear where the research gaps are. In fact, we can highlight some of the projects that are going on, even in small scale, if some projects are going on that along with uh, what further need to be done and why that kind of things if we share, then we'll be knowing what exact expertise is available on the Australian side. And then in Indian side, what are the availability? And then we can formulate some project. And being in IITs, we have the opportunity to collaborate, even without a project in the form of a PhD research guide kind of thing. So if we find that that kind of works are going on there, then we can also look for that kind of opportunity. And that's not a big uh, problem also. This will initiate some research activity. So thank mm. you. Mm. Yes, I like that very much. It's good to know who's doing what and where they're doing it and um, what success they're having, as well as the problems they're having. We, we tend to only talk about the good things in research, but it's good to know what doesn't work as much as what does work. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, can you summarize this point as minimizing uh, this information? between India and Australia in the water sector, that will initiate uh, some collaborative research activity. So can we summarize that point, sir? Yeah, you can basically say minim minimize the information gap and build visibility for the work that's happening in both the countries. Hmm. So are there suggestions of how could we increase that visibility? And do we need um, much more of this kind of sessions or um, what, what would be the, the way to go? Uh, I would like to add one point, sir. Uh, apart from the sharing at the academic level, uh, we need to uh, uh, come together, all the ex professionals working in the uh, groundwater also. Uh, like the birth example we have seen in the, in the first session. So can we develop a, a case study in India also with the professional of Australia and the working professional in India. So if it almost demonstrates such an example here in the country, it will be very good. I think and, uh, it will be uh, uh, benefit for other cities also. That's from my side. I think, um, I think the fact that we've had COVID for the last two years has certainly done a lot of damage in the relationships that we previously enjoyed, which perhaps were much more closer between Australia and India. Yep. And that absence of uh, contact over the last two and a half years has left a little bit of a hole, but now's a great time to rejuvenate the relationship and this uh, workshop's a good opportunity. I think the Australia India Research Centre that was referred to earlier and which uh, Roger probably knows quite well because of its uh, connections with the University of Western Sydney, that provides a good focus for sharing what's going on in research because I think there's 18 universities, I think we're told, and 15 Australian universities. Yeah. So it's not all the universities, but it's a pretty broad spectrum across India and Australia. So if they could share some of the research, that would be very valuable. And while I agree that online relationships like this are valuable, I think the return for some visits, I'm not promoting visits per se, but the return for some visits will help re-establish that personal link. Sometimes it's a little hard to get the personal element across through, uh, through Zoom or Teams or whatever. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask a question in terms of, um, um, it's all very good uh, and and, uh, we know that it is extremely useful to know each other better and what we are doing on both sides and that that is very informative. But at some point in a relationship, you need money, you need a project, you need otherwise it stops. Uh -huh. um, I get daily requests for people to come here and work with me. But if, if there is no, no Fine. practical means, are there, in your opinion, enough possibilities to fund these type of collaborations that we are looking for? Uh, yeah, suppose some of the projects are going on, even in private sector also. Uh, just taking an example from northeastern part of India, we are basically having a lot of surface water. And because of that, even agriculture feels suffer uh, for water logging. So that has the two benefit that you, if you are doing research from that in a scientific way, 
then water logging problem is solved as well as your groundwater research is happening. So that kind of project can be funded uh, from even some private sector. We are already implementing such project of groundwater research in some tea garden area. Now, if we want to do, but then we do not know what is happening exactly to the groundwater, suppose assessment part, what is the impact of such project that we are not having. So if we can find out some project, then uh, if we can expand that project further, then we can seek for government fund as well as private sector fund. And that is of course necessary without that nothing will be progressing. Thank you. Yeah. So can well, there are a couple of, um, sorry, uh, Alok, you're planning to say something? Yeah, yes, sir. That uh, summarization of this, uh, our, uh, the second point of this session. So let us learn from each other, like some good examples that for uh, like the managed aquifer system that can be really implementable in India. Similarly, uh, uh, Professor Raitlao told uh, in Northeast India some uh, surface water projects are going on, but the environmental impact uh, they had to be assessed. They can that uh, projects can be transferred, uh, technology can, can be transferred to Australia. And uh, uh, obviously, there are some uh, uh, on, on implementation of these good practices and learn from each other that will uh, go for fundraising, also some academic training and research activity. So, can we write uh, that summarize that point? In that way, yeah, I think so. You can uh, just a kind of add to what uh, Professor Sharma said. Uh, see, any research collaboration for it to be viable, I think the government has to take the lead because the private sector never takes the lead investing in research. Um, you know, it, it, because the government has to take the lead between Australia and India, you do have the Australia India Strategic Research Fund. But you know, yes. every year there is a lot of competing demands on the fund. You know, it could be say mining or critical minerals in a year. It could be COVID in a particular year. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to kind of you know get your water projects um, up the pecking order. So maybe there is a need for a dedicated fund between the two governments uh, to start you know a corpus that needs to be set up to kickstart research in this area. But once you know, and and also the problem with uh, private sector funding is because water is not yet you know. Um, a commodity in the sense, you know, there is no monetary value to water, more so groundwater. It's kind of a free for all situation, more so in India. The Indian private sector is definitely, you know, going to be reluctant to invest in research uh, till such um, time, you know. Hmm. Yes, sir, put, put, sir. yes, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Sankar, uh, this government sector is definitely the first priority. Yeah, true. and then what I'm saying is that even private sector will also come forward later, yeah, when they get a direct benefit. True. Uh, but I mean, then government a, sector should be our first target. Then true. giving an example that something is already going on, then with true. that, if we approach government sector, there will be better opportunity to get funding. That's what it was my exactly. Point. Like it's just kind of you know going back to what and it will be industry that. government interaction kind of things also because already true. industry is associated, the true. industry is associated. Then requesting government, there will be better opportunity. Sure. In fact, you know, some, something like the Perth, you know, project that we, was very interesting. If India were to roll out a similar project, it would be in the PPP mode, typically in yes. India. And of course, yes. you'll have the private sector participation. At that point, the private sector may start getting interested in investing, you know, in research here. But till that point, we need the governments to take the lead. I think, you know, yes. there is a strong or a very solid case for India and Australia basically coming together and creating a new research, research fund uh, for, you know, collaboration with water and more specifically groundwater. Yeah, that is always welcome. Yes. Yeah, excellent. I'd like to invite um, um, maybe Udi Shema or, or Prachi or Mima. You're you're the younger generation. You're the future, uh, and you are the ones who will have to cope with the issues or end up probably also to solve them. Uh, any idea, proposals, or what you think is needed, or? Uh, sir, I would like. Oh. Sir, I would like to add one point, sir. Uh, actually, in India, awareness is the main issue for the conservation of groundwater. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we hear yeah, you. Yeah. Awareness is the main issue uh, in relation to groundwater. And irrigation is the major component where you use groundwater. So if we can uh, establish a center uh, where we can help uh, get help from the Australian side that to, how to aware people. We are doing here in Central Groundwater Board also. A lot of NGOs are working. But if we can add something, uh, that will be a better thing. And apart from that, a lot of artificial recharge is going by the government, NGOs, and many, many industrialists all are doing the artificial recharge. 
but just we have seen in the uh, uh, last session that how we can uh, formulate the policy also how we can refine our policy also on the like like in australia for managed equity for recharge so for policy also we need to uh, 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 incorporate many things for the quality standard we need to refine our policy also so definitely in that part we can get help from the uh, from the australia and uh, it will be very helpful for india also because once we will contaminate the aquifer uh, we cannot help it will be disastrous so uh, i think that in two, at two positions we can get help also thank you great very good point prachi uh, from my side i want to say actually i have attended some state government meetings i have seen ngos have lots of data and lots of information about particular any areas so their data should also be included in any project i mm. think uh, that is also reliable uh, because the government manpower is not so much to um, and, uh, interpret any type of project for so i think ngos data should be included in any project and also laboratory facilities also provided so we can go high level studies like isotope studies because now it is it is also difficult to analyze isotopic data very few real laboratories are in india so i want to include that things in my course okay nice um, uh something sorry say it again uh, may, uh, i i want to include one point sir okay good uh so the capacity building uh, seems to be a major feasible option but capacity building uh, should be customized as for all the stakeholders and uh, the stakeholders uh, should be starting from the common villagers to policy politician or the policy makers and uh, it should be customized and water literacy should be introduction uh, introduced to all the formal and informal education in the sector because in india we are just uh, shifting our uh, mindset from water management to water governance so i think the uh, capacity building should be customized to all the stakeholders and the water uh, whatever the management plan should involve all the stakeholders starting from uh, the common user or the common villagers yeah excellent um we have 20 seconds left and then we will be automatically returned is there some burning um yeah. remark one topic groundwater research through watershed management that can also be one topic of research collaborative yeah research. thank you very much see you soon had some good discussions i'm sure you had um, a lot to say in a very short amount of time um I think is it uh Alex Flood were you moderating room 1 would you like to report back or nominate the report back from your room we had uh, professor prasad was going to do the report back from our room over to you professor prasad yes yeah uh now good afternoon from india so i think each report please take two or three minutes so that we have more time for discussion i think i'm audible yes yes, yes. okay 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 uh good afternoon i am uh, professor prasad from uh, gb pant university of agriculture and technology india we have a uh, breakout room of around uh, 12 people including uh, uh, many experts from in both india as well as uh, australia uh, and uh, some of the things we uh, discussed are they have been put forward by both the ex uh, both side experts that includes uh, in the, we have to study about how to use the uh, sewerage water for irrigation purpose the technology needs to be developed that is one thing and uh, next is uh, these uh, springs rejuvenation how it will help for uh, eco flow or you can say ecological maintenance of rivers so the sort of studies also needs to be carried out and the inertia to that uh, there is a need for uh, land subsidence studies jointly 
in addition to that there will be a climate change studies effect on ground water that study has to be undertaken of course there will be a salt water intrusion particularly in coastal areas that water in this studies has to be undertaken maybe jointly even though some studies are on but uh, particularly from uh, australian experts may be involved in uh, uh, some of the indian coastal areas so that uh, they can transfer their knowledge to indian continent and vice versa also and some uh, some of the uh, our uh, i think sunil kumar ji uh, is a chief engineer of training center he has uh, insisted on exchange of faculty between uh, uh, india and australia and vice versa uh, then uh, some water audit has to be done for that collaborative action needs to be introduced and uh, there may be some uh, modules can be prepared jointly which can be implemented uh, maybe both uh, india as well as uh, australia and based on that thing uh, many modules can be developed that's what uh, in a nutshell uh, our uh, discussions to space uh, as a summary yes there has to be exchange and there are some key areas which have been uh, identified uh, that needs to be developed in future uh, training periods that's what uh, this is a summary of the discussions which we had it in our group please thank you please thank you very much dr prasad can i ask um, rebecca nixon to report back on room 2 or or tell us your report with the permission of chair what would you like to add one important thing is left uh the important thing is basically to uh the enhanced capacity of the villagers through training which the australian counterpart has got expertise thank you very much um, mr yeah, thank thanks everyone uh so group 2 uh we're talking about the opportunities uh, and challenges across both countries um the key key topic we talked about was a main challenge in india at the moment is the ownership of groundwater and that if you if you have land or access to a well you can access groundwater so there's significant challenges in moving towards a regulatory um regulating the water access and managing the water take and the associated challenges with too much take because there's no regulation around who can access that water there's no regulation around ownership of the groundwater so some of the things we discussed was whether uh, access to the machinery that can dig wells will help uh, sort of motivate people towards a regulatory system um and that perhaps as a needs to be community support at ground level before any sort of regulatory system will actually uh, be able to be put in place uh Karen I'm afraid you still you still not quite audible give it give another shot yes double mute there sorry thank you Rebecca <laughs> and uh over to you Henry thank you <laughs> Thanks Karen. Um well, I have delegated responsibility for reporting back to um Carlene Maywald, Maywald. Uh so Carlene, if I could invite you to just give a quick summary of what we discussed that was Carlene. Yes, great. Yes, thank you. Um thanks very much Henry and we had a, a bit of a discussion regarding um monitoring and metering uh, as it was introduced initially that we need to measure it more locations and we need to monitor more effectively and um more carefully and i think then the discussion evolved around um if you can't if you can't measure it you can't manage it and uh, the challenges that we have being able to not only measure at the um the large scale the size of the aquifer um the availability of the water the recharge capacity the opportunity for recharge um um groundwater recharge and then on the other side of it the the measurement of the extractions and the the regulatory regime that enables um um management of of the the take of water as well and that there seems to be a a a significant amount of work that needs to be done in that area 
not only in um, um, Australia, but also in India. Uh, and also we, we then talked about um, the monitoring and meeting, metering technologies um, and the challenges that um, we have in both countries in, in bringing new innovation to the table and finding pathways to market for that innovative technology. Um, that both our, our um, water supply um, systems for agriculture and for water in Australia um, and India are largely government owned systems. And those government owned systems have entrenched and very conservative procurement processes and thinking about how they um, embrace new innovation in the area of um, um, not only just water management, but water innovation all um, together. And so that one of the challenges and one of the constraints that we could probably work on together is, is around the, um, um, the constraints to bringing new innovation to market. The other thing we talked about um, was around what can we do in the collaboration space between the two countries uh, and the challenges that we have in that regard and that we need to consider innovative models for creating joint um, studies and joint research programs that can provide benefit to, to participants from both countries. And so when we are um, considering um, the pricing models and the like for the research and all those sorts of things, we have to ensure that there is a fair and equitable um, um, distribution and model that enables both um, those participating in India and those participating in Australia, in Australia to get value out of what's being um, invested in. I think that covers what we talked about, Henry. Is that pretty much cover it? Yeah, I think I think on the whole that pretty much covers it. And we couldn't quite solve the uh, the wicked problem of how to get governments and not only governments but also universities to authorize uh, innovation and to go out on a limb and back themselves and try new things. Um, it couldn't be solved in 15 minutes. We'll right. give it another shot. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Carleen. Your best efforts. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks very much, um, Carleen and, and Henry. Um, could I now please ask room four? I think that's you, Ricky Spencer, to report. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, room four, we were looking at challenges and opportunities, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Srikant. Uh, Doctor, sorry, um, to uh, to talk uh, about our discussion and um, what we had in again fifteen minutes to to uh, to solve those problems. Thanks, thanks, Ricky. Um, yeah, we had uh, five people in our uh, breakout room with people from different backgrounds, from academia, research, um, and a government agency, like Central Groundwater Board from India. Um, in terms of the issues and challenges, we talked about um, essentially fundamental challenges um, in, in, in basic research, for example, from a managed aquifer recharge perspective, there's still a dearth of um, uh, fundamental data around water quality measurements um, uh, uh, because of the challenges in uh, limited funding for um, academic or other research agencies. Um, the opportunity we discussed around that was that uh, perhaps we could start from basic measurements, the, the, the parameters that we can monitor could be measured and then learn based on that and then invest in, in uh, 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 other parameters that, that would need more uh, sophisticated equipments. Um, we also talked about um, challenges with skills and expertise um, in areas, for example, like geological or groundwater modeling. Um, uh, uh, one particular challenge with the Indian scenario is, is that uh, there is a lot of uh, skills um, around that kind of um, technical areas, but they largely sit in academic institutions like IITs or, or uh, universities or, or nationally important organizations like CGWB or NIH. Um, in the case of Australia, it is, the transfer of knowledge is a bit easier because um, we have uh, similar skills in, in a state and a cent a state and local self government institutions whereby a transfer of information or or, uh, or tools uh, developed by research agencies or, or development agencies can be transferred into um, operational scale or or to the actual decision making managers and they're able to use that to make the, their uh, water management decisions uh, we also discussed about a lack of essential data like digital elevation model in the, in the indian context to uh, make uh, um, uh, things like modeling work, for example, in the Marvi uh, work, um, 
uh, the uh, elevations of the area where uh, that were available were often erroneous by up to five meters. So in spite of having large groundwater level uh, 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 monitoring information, from example, uh, 250 bores, that information could not be used in, uh, using a, a tool like a, a groundwater model because the uh, basic data uh, of uh, the digital elevation model was uh, lacking. So um, agencies like the Central Groundwater Board could perhaps in invest in national scale um, uh, digital elevation models that could be made use by all, all kinds of agencies to make other data available and useful for um, uh, research. We also talked about similarities and differences in scale in, in hydrology in, in hydrology and, and population and, and that kind of differences. And in terms of commonalities, we found uh, the, the similar setup uh, between the state and federal governments in terms of water management would make it easy for um, knowledge transfer from Australia um, uh, to India, particularly for cases like basin planning where both levels of government are often involved. And both countries have challenges in terms of uh, issues like larger scale initiatives like river basin planning. Um, um, that, uh, there are some differences um, uh, in the nature of uh, those challenges though. For example, in, in, in case of Australia, um, a management option like a like managed aquifer recharge uh, could be challenging in, from a river basin context because different states and different stakeholders interpret the um, uh, uh, for example, the water carryover, th there are different terminologies used by different stakeholders which make um, uh, 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 available water um, manageable and saved using managed aquifer recharge, for example. For, uh, whereas in the case of um, India, um, uh, uh, the basin planning approaches could be started with um, hard rock terrains where there are only a fewer number of stakeholders operating with the limited amount of water, whereas if we, if we scale into a larger alluvial aquifer, there are hundreds of thousands of Dr. stakeholders, Sikhan. which make it very yeah. difficult to manage. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that, that was a, a long, <laughs> long one, but yeah. I finished. Yeah, thanks very much, Shrikant. And uh, could I ask uh, room five, that's Debbie Atkins to, to report. Okay, I have a, written it up, so I may need to share my screen, if that's possible. Oh, um, can you see that? No, that's I okay. think, yeah. I think if you could just um, read them off um, quickly because- Yes, yeah. we discussed that sometimes people um, do not understand the dollar value of water if it's free. So then put a dollar value on, on why you get involved in particular projects. So also see the value of water in times of financial, environmental and social benefits. Uh, we discussed the issue of social acceptance in India of using wastewater. So therefore, how do you change the mindset? So convince people that water is fine to use. So research in this area and also look what else is happening, what's successful elsewhere. Um, focusing on increasing the efficiency of water use. So there's, I'm sure there's a lot of research and outcomes. It's a matter of promoting that. So maybe investment in promotion. We encourage involvement in projects that currently work, such as Marvi. So it's working elsewhere, scale up Marvi, it should be applicable to other areas. Again, promote the tangible benefits and results of being involved in projects. So the financial, um, the career results and the organisational benefits, and also the funding talks. So make funding available and learn from cooperation between other organisations. That's great. Thanks very much, Debbie. Um, could I invite room six to report back, Dharma? That was your room. Yeah, no, that's right, uh, Karan. Uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, we looked at uh, question number two. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the first uh, point was, uh, you know, the, in the collaboration, we need to use a bottom-up approach, um, involve people at ground level, um, and the other uh, point uh, which came up was the exchange of uh, staff and students. In addition to that, uh, uh, I think there was a bit of an emphasis on uh, exchanging ground level staff, uh, you know, who are working at the ground level, you know, how we can bring them uh, across, uh, you know, both, uh, both the countries and give them a bit of an exposure uh, of uh, activities which is occurring in the other country. Uh, and also include NGOs in that. Um, 
and uh, the about the funding i think that's a, that's a million dollar question um uh, the, uh i think uh, there was a suggestion that why don't we use a ppp model uh, to fund some of these uh, if, for that i think uh, you know the, the question comes back uh, saying that um, uh, we might have to charge the water which is extracted from the you know the the uh, uh, from the bore well uh, so that could be, you know, one, one thing that can be used, and then uh, you take a portion of that and you use it for, the, you know, the, uh, you know, funding the, you know, training and so on. Um, and also, you know, the, could we look at the export opportunities for the Australian, uh, uh, you know, the experience of MAD, uh, you know, can be exported to India, probably stakeholder engagement model, which has developed in uh, uh, India as a part of Mavi could be exported to Australia. So there could be some export opportunities there. And uh, the other uh, point we discussed was uh, um, applying Mavi internationally. Okay, those are the points. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dharma. Great points. Um, and I think, um, okay, we are from room seven. Would you like to give a report? Yes, uh, indeed. Um, I will refer to Alok Mehar. He was so uh, kind to make notes and report. Alok? He's here. Hello, Alok. Alok, could you report on outcomes of our group? Yes, yes, sir. I, I report there, sir. This is the, the, the first point we have discussed in, uh, about this minimization of the information gap. Uh, between Australian and Indian partners to and build visibility to find out the research gaps to address the common groundwater issues. So that will actually initiate some research activity by involving some research scholars or some high level professors, academicians. That will be a good initiative between India and Australia. And second thing we have discussed the implementation of good practices, same as uh, from Australia and from India. Like uh, in Australia, the good, one of the good practices is the Perth uh, MAR project with some risk assessment. So that will be very novel work. That should be, uh, that can be transport, uh, that technology can be transferred to India to address this uh, common issue of this groundwater. Same as for India, we have uh, good uh, expertise uh, in the uh, construction of dam building, uh, surface water uh, management, particularly in the Northeastern India with the uh, environmental uh, management system. So that uh, technology can be transferred to Australia. So we can learn from each other by Australian and Indian uh, uh, expertise. The third point we have uh, summarized that we should, uh, the Indian, Australian, we, we have uh, some uh, explore the collaborative funding opportunity by uh, means involving the government as well as involvement of the private parties uh, through PPP mode. Obviously, the government will uh, take initiative, but uh, we should uh, take some uh, funds or take some expertise from for the private parties also. So that project uh, can be implemented through PPP mode. And the fourth point uh, we have discussed, the uh, explore the mutual expertise for training uh, of this uh, common people, like involving of the all the stakeholders in the groundwater management, starting from the common people to politicians, NGOs, and the politicians. So that uh, the possibilities between the India and Australia we have explored. Uh, so this point uh, we have uh, summarized in group number seven. Thank you very much, Alec. That's um, that's terrific. Um, uh, thanks for all that feedback from our breakout groups, and we'll make sure that's incorporated into our report back to government. Um, I'd like to now invite Professor Basant Maheshwari to introduce our open forum program, and hope you can all stay on for that. Thank you, Karen. And uh, I think we have probably 20 minutes or how long we have, Karen? Yes, I think that's right, 20 minutes. Okay. So I think the, what, what we want to do is first to we'll invite uh, the, our two panelists, uh, Carlin Mevold and uh, uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar, to share about two, three minutes of their thoughts on what has gone through or what they want to share. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Sunil Kumarji to say a few words before we take the questions on. And then we have uh, Dr. Peter Dillon and uh, um, Dr. Nand Kumaran 
to answer any questions. And uh, along with that, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Professor O.K. Batalan will, uh, will keep eye on the chat room. So please do post your questions and uh, he will be able to catch them and uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask the panel. So it, I hope it, it will be really very interactive session. And let's start with uh, Sunil Kumarji. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Maheshwari. Uh, actually, I had a small presentation of five, six slides. I think the time do not permit that. Yeah. So I would just uh, go through. Uh, so if you can kindly keep around three, four minutes will be yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. That will be uh, within that. Uh, okay. So. Is here and uh, share my screen. Share. Do, do we start with uh, okay. Carly? It and is then... taking some. Uh, That's okay. Things so... to, to leave the session and something. So I will just. Uh, speak up. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, I prepared my PPT in a very different way, not the way we were discussing the groundwater scenario in India. That part has been covered by Dr. Nand Kumar. So, uh, my uh, issue was when we were discussing sustainability of the groundwater resources. So, we need to keep in mind the social, economic, and the environmental uh, component in mind. And then the important is in case of we are discussing the groundwater sustainability. So we need to think in, in the line of decentralized participation and the data knowledge, which one of the group has discussed. We need to en uh, enforce the control like the regulation. And uh, because the, uh, the sustainability is a term where the, there's a conflicting demand. Uh, on the one hand, we need to address the issue of the environmental challenges. On the other hand, we need to meet the requirement of the, the development, like the industry or the infrastructure. So in, in, this, in this scenario, we need to see the assessment of the whole resource of the country, because India is a very big country. We need to know what is there, how much is there, and when it is available throughout the year, and how can protect it, what precaution we need to take, and then prioritize the resource allocation. So. Uh, once we go to prioritize the soil allocation, we prepared a, a model bill, which is actually under finalization and going to put up maybe in the parliament session, the next session, next monsoon session. So here uh, we propose the, 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 the three-tier system of the management, central, state, district, and then coming to next block or panchayat level and through various type of councils and uh, uh, committees. So that the groundwater become the uh, issue of every day, uh, every person, and they manage their resource. Then uh, the uh, we need we had also the focus in the uh, model will uh, to protect the various zones like the contaminant zones, recharge zones, coastal areas, wetlands. We need to focus on the waste disposal, mine lease. So uh, in total, if we see. We need to have a uh, environment friendly and sound regulation uh, for throughout India. And uh, there have been issues that some states who are governing themselves, they have a different regulation and uh, center has a different regulation. So we need to adopt a uniform regulation throughout India. And uh, uh, the basically the two things come out of my this PPT or this uh, whole uh, discussion. One is the we need to assess, then we need to protect, and we need to regulate the resource. So that is available throughout the year to the users. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there are some key points here and really valuable. Uh, I'd like to request uh, the Honorable Carly Mevor to share some thoughts. Thank you, Vasant. Uh, just in talking uh, in the group and the, uh, the breakout boxes and also through the presentations that we received, the job that we have ahead of us is just enormous. And so we're going to have to work hard on breaking it up into manageable bits. 
and understanding where the blockages are and work through where those blockages are to enable us to actually address some of these really substantive challenges. I think one of the things that I'd like to focus on um, is, is the fact that at the heart of all of this is people. Um, we have technology, we have knowledge of where there are perhaps um, inefficiencies in regulation. We also understand a lot about what the problem is, um, but we actually don't engage well enough with our communities to bring them along on the journey with us. It's our communities that have to live with the results or the outcomes of the decisions that are made at various levels from the central government right down to the local governments and to the local villages level. Uh, and the, those communities are going to be there long after we've all gone. <laughs> and, and so unless we're engaging with them and embracing their concerns, the hearts and souls and minds of those people who are living with these water scarcity issues and involve them in not only helping us to, to define the localised problem and how that fits into the bigger picture problem, but then working with them to partner with the scientific community to actually work out what questions we need answered in the research that are going to then be applicable to those communities and then co-design with them what the solutions are going to look like. Dr Nanda Kamaran um, made some really valid points about the difficulty of trying to make one size fits all in the space of water management and in particular groundwater management. There's no two communities are at the same starting point and no com two communities from one end of India to the other or one end of Australia to the other have the same issues in their local context. And so we need to be able to break it down into that, into that more manageable pieces and bring the communities along with us and engage deeply with those communities in a way that's meaningful. It's not only about just ticking a box and saying we went out and we spoke to them. It's about how you develop relationships with those communities, how you build trust with those, those communities, and then how you actually actively engage them as participants in defining what the solution is going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Carlene. And I think your point about community is really critical, how you connect community, the science and the policy and uh, really bring them together. So thank you. So now the floor is open for questions or comments. And so we are going to do in two ways. One is through chat box. And the other one is uh, we can invite, please put your hand up. And also when you want to talk, please put your video on and so that we can see you. And uh, uh, please be brief in your questions straight to the point and that way we can get the answer. So I think Professor Tanu Jindal. Yes, yeah, please. good afternoon everyone here. Uh, and I think there too. Yeah, so I would like to also ask for like, since because of the COVID, there is huge waste uh, is been uh, discharged in water stream. So like what kind of effort we can take for the monitoring of you know, huge amount of drug residues and covid related waste in the water bodies thank you thank you and thank you for being to the point so maybe could i ask peter uh, <coughs> um, the question was from uh, professor tanu jindal so there is so much waste due to the covid in water and how do we manage that right um, it's a good question um, and I think that there will always be uh, new contaminants coming along that we will have to stretch ourselves to uh, to be able to manage them as uh, as we as we discover them. Uh, so um, plastics and nanoparticles are, uh, are one of those one of those issues. Um, in general, it's not been uh, of concern in managed aquifer recharge because a lot of particulates get um, separated through the passage through porous media. Uh, in hard rock aquifers, that may be more, more difficult, but in general, uh, uh, we haven't been involved with um, many urban projects in uh, hard rock aquifers. Um, and then you would need to pre-treat. So, if your, if your guidelines uh, can include all of the contaminants that you're expecting to find, then uh, 
and you know how to manage those contaminants to remove them uh, so that the, you get to an acceptable level for public health and the environment, then uh, it's all, it, it can all be done. But I think at local level, it would be useful to have ex examples where people are, uh, where researchers are working on those issues uh, to get them involved with uh, uh, managed aquifer recharge and groundwater projects. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next question. Uh, okay, do we have anything in the chat box? Yeah, there is a question from uh, Nasimha on lifting water to highland also has the advantage of improving groundwater in highlands. And she's asking experts in the forum to comment. Okay, so maybe could I ask uh, Dr. Dandakumaran if that falls in your um, area? I'm not sure what uh, he means by lifting water to highlands. But I understand that it involves pumping water against the force of gravity. Yes, yes, Nandakumarji, if you know uh, the state of Telangana, uh, they have been in the last five to six years, they have been lifting water to highland to almost hundreds of kilometers away from the rivers. And I, I understand at least tens of thousands of hectares of land, if not hundreds of thousands, has been uh, basically water has been made available to those farmers. So what I'm saying is basically not only the directly lifted water and stored in the reservoirs are useful, but also the groundwater in those highland areas will be improved. That's that's my uh, uh, non-water specialist understanding. Oh, you, are, uh, you, are very, you are very correct in uh, definitely it will improve the groundwater situation in the highland areas. However, this will entail enormous costs actually in terms yes. of construction and uh, the power and the, prior, the cost of the prior, the power which is required and the construction that so again you have to go for a sort of trade off between what is the benefit you can get and uh, what is the expenses which you are going to incur my suggestion is it will be better to go for the local uh, solution sort of rainwater harvesting or available water conservation increased water conservation measures will work out much cheaper and because again, maintenance is a big issue when you are pumping water for so many kilometers against the gravity. So I think that may not, in the long run, that may not be economically very viable. That is what I feel. Okay. Not only the initial construction cost, you are saying that uh, the maintenance cost also will be huge. Yes, yes, yes. And the energy costs. Energy, cost. energy costs will be massive. Yes. Exactly. If you, um, we have an example here in South Australia where um, we had um, localised irrigation by a river on a floodplain area and, and um, was a major flood came through and wiped the whole area out. So governments decided in their, their wisdom that it would be a good idea to build a new irrigation system away from the floodplain area, um, it's probably about 30 or 40 kilometres away from the river and pump it to the highland area. Now, initially, that sounded like a great idea, um, and there was a, a, a you know a huge area of irrigation that was opened up. But without educating the irrigators on how to better use water, what happened was the impact on the aquifers were not just more water in the aquifers, so improving the aquifers, but it actually created perched aquifers, and those perched aquifers then created problems for the production of in those irrigation districts because all of the root systems became inundated and embedded and salinity increased dramatically. So it had a whole range of other negative impacts on that particular area that then had to be had to be dealt with. And the answer to those questions were then about teaching irrigators and providing the irrigators the wherewithal to introduce more efficient irrigation systems, reduce the amount of water that goes through the, the soil profile and into the aquifer and maximize the amount that's used by the plant. To do that, you've got to have, you know, the resources to do it. You've got to have the irrigators who have a production capacity that's profitable enough for them to be able to afford the, the um, technical solution. And you've got to have 
irrigators that are producing products and getting a price for it that enables them to pay for the energy as well as the water infrastructure. Um, and all of those things need to line up for something like that to work. So I guess the answer here is when you're looking at these kind of projects is you need to do a proper and full cost benefit analysis, which includes a whole range of externalities in regards to the local environment that you'll be impacting upon. Thank you, Carleen. And uh, Narsima, you have raised a very important and complex question here. Uh, so any further question? Uh, okay, Alok. Uh, yes, sir. So actually one of the major challenges uh, regarding this uh, groundwater management, particularly in the quality issue, is the poor translation of uh, laboratory uh, technologies from uh, to field level, actually. I mean to say, uh, as a PhD scholar or a research institute, we are developing uh, so many lots of technology at laboratory scale for, uh, say, for uh, removal of fluoride or removal of uh, uranium or selenium, some in, in, inorganic contaminant from drinking water. But that technology has been restricted only to laboratory scale only. That uh, few of, very few have been transferred to the labs, lab to land scale. So what actually would need to be done at the policy scale or any other scale uh, to have a greater feasibility that uh, the common technology should reach to the common people or the local user only. So we may learn from Australian partner or Indian context, what are the obstacles uh, and how can we overcome that challenge particularly? Thank you, hello. So it's more like a comment, but if uh, any of the panel members want to comment, please uh, come forward. Perhaps I'll make a comment, um, Basant. Um, it's quite true, the uptake of those kind of technologies, those technologies are there, they exist, we can clean water up. There is absolutely no doubt about that, but it comes back to cost again. Um, and they are very, very expensive to actually upscale that kind of technology on a broad scale across a range of different regions. And without having the concurrent policy settings to enable the true cost of water to be charged to those who are using it, it falls back to the government to have to pay for it all the time. And of course, for the governments, those kind of expenses are getting just too much out of the reach of their, their, um, their revenue um, capacity. Uh, and, and it's not just setting the um, infrastructure up, it's about the long-term operation and maintenance of that, that, that equipment, which also requires energy. It also requires you know, a, um, a management um, and, and upkeep for the life of the, um, the asset. Uh, and so that all has to be factored in as well. And unless you have a concurrent um, parallel process to start to introduce pricing for water infrastructure, and I say it like that deliberately, it's not pricing for water because water falls out of the sky free, it runs down the river for free. But to get it from that river to your property in a fit for purpose state that's dealing with the quality of the water as well as the quantity of water takes infrastructure. So we have to start talking to people about the fact that they're not paying for the water, but if they want that water delivered to their property 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then they've got to pay for that infrastructure. And unless we start a parallel process to actually encourage people to do that, it'll be really difficult to find the, exp um, the, um, the revenue pathways to be able to invest in these kind of technologies. Thank you, Carleen. Very important point you mentioned about the revenue part. Uh, I think we have Dr. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Jay Prakash Verma. Yes, yes, sir. So, right. I want to emphasize the two important point. I think, sir, especially for the government of India, Sunil Kumar sir has given the lot of nice things. My question is that in the government here, suppose I am just working in the BHU Banaras Hindu University, but in Banaras Hindu University, very few water recharging system, lot of rainwater just, just flow in the Ganga. So I think in the government of India to need to ask this, is, uh, all government building, especially institution, at least to make groundwater recharging system, especially rainwater. Because I have the visited in Australia, eight month thing, every houses have the uh, rainwater recharging system and the building, especially in India, if following this rule, maybe some water, uh, groundwater can recharge. Another things, uh, grey water, especially on sewage, can be partially purified and can be used for the um, vegetable and maybe gardening purpose. These two important things from my side. 
but in india i have seen very few example in australia is very common things for use in western sydney is the use grey water for the irrigation purpose and every houses have the rain water recharging system but india i think so if uh, i just uh, take the permission for the uh, house making but uh, vda give the permission without uh, your system have the rain water recharging or not this is the, i think uh, take the especially policy planning so i mean this is for the here some many government uh, here people to maybe make the some rules and regulation to can make the maintain the water recharging system in india thank you thank you thank you thank you uh, uh sirul kumar ji do you have any comment on what dr verma said uh, your microphone is off dr maheshwari may i respond to the yes please uh, yes please uh as he has rightly pointed out that the recharge facility need to be created by all the government buildings and all the university institutions and the private land holders so uh i would like to inform here that uh, way back i think one and a half year is already over uh 20 september 20 uh see so the ministry of shakti has a guideline that all the government buildings all the uh, industry all the infrastructure they need to have their in water harvesting and uh, to promote this we have we just last week we discussed with the dr sandeep singh in university of roorkee we are going to have a, a, a workshop i have think for all the institute of india in the month of may itself to educate them or to just the inform them that this is mandatory for the each and every institutions to go for rain water harvesting so that the, that the, that is the one point i wanted to say and the second point the recharging of the uh, use of the sewer water is actually quality issues are there and uh, india and australia both are working on that the what should be the correct uh, the criteria of the recharging water thank you thank you and also i want to mention that uh, there could be uh, collaboration in the domestic rain water harvesting it's now more or less every house a new house has got uh, rain water harvesting and there could be some learning between the two countries for so how out of 36 uh, states 34 has got the this this uh, all 36 has got the this mandatory uh, recharge uh, bill that every building they will get this uh, map pass only after they are having this rainwater harvesting uh, they have different type of plots the size of plots beyond which they need to have the rainwater harvesting in that so thank it you. is already built in in the urban bylaws thank you uh, dr rajaram purohit uh, please uh, switch on your microphone yeah sir uh, i am not dr rajaram i am using his link i am dr suresh from cw okay uh, i just saw <laughs> your name so uh, I, i also couldn't believe that you are rajaram thank <laughs> you for that okay my uh, one thing i feel is the big challenge is the uh, ownership of ground water which we have discussed in our this thing also like in surface water we have a riparian rights so when he, somebody takes the water from the river some authority is there from which they have to take the permission we cannot just take the water from the river for your own use whereas in ground water it is not so and it is a really a big challenge because uh, giving permits for a each and every drop of water oil is very difficult because of population is very large and it is going to be very difficult and a huge problem now whereas in so all the rivers are regulated somebody other is the owner of the thing either the state or some authority is the owner of the water so any uh, so water is completely accounted that the water is going how much water is going whereas in ground water we don't have that that is one of the basic challenge so uh, in australia also one of my my friends are working in australia they used to tell that whenever somebody wants to drill level they have to take a permission from the this thing and they even sell water with the permission of uh, authorities so that is a big challenge this is not possible in india so somewhere we have to have a, some sort of a, this one because only regulation will never help and without regulation it is a voluntary participation also will not be a so good solution so that should be some sort of a compromise and uh, the regulation 
education management should go hand in hand so what i feel is unless and until this point is the major point is challenge the ground water will always become stressed area in future so this thank is you. The thank you uh, any comment from any of the panelists uh, dr nand kumar any no, probably dr suresh was telling the credit system what the mare darling basin they are doing the credit of the one land owner can be transferred to other that is not there in india but selling of in india through the bulk water supply like tanker it is built in the jal shakti guideline thank you okay so i think uh, we have whatever time we allocated we cross that but uh, i would like to ask each panelist one final question and uh, 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 please say what you think so i'd like to ask first of all carlin uh, what do you see future of groundwater in next 10 years i think the uh, i see the way that we're going in addressing the major issues that we have in managing groundwater better it's only going to get worse before it gets better um there has to be a much more significant uh i guess a focus on the regulation the manage me- the measurement and the management of groundwater not just in india and australia but everywhere and we also need to consider the conjunctive um, management of groundwater and surface water and they cannot be considered in isolation which in most instances they are uh, and i see this being a significant problem for us in the future thank you carlin so nicely put together uh, sunil kumar ji what do you think the future of groundwater in next 10 years uh, no, i do agree with the madam what she has told that the regulation is a very important issue and uh, the focus need to be given to the agriculture uh, we need to at least uh, monitor how much they are consuming we need to put in meters there and uh, improve the water use efficiency include the public into the uh, into the management system of the groundwater uh otherwise we will have will not have a good future of the groundwater so thank you we so need much. to uh, we need to make the as per the un uh, slogan also we need to make this invisible visible to the people thank you thank you thank you uh dr peter dillon peter peter you still there yep thanks prasad um i agree with uh Kalain's uh, uh, assessment also um i think there are some positive things uh, the my well app that you could tell people about uh is something that would democratize data and make it accessible to every individual uh within a, a catchment and and so uh, give uh, a level of understanding and uh through cooperative arrangements like village groundwater cooperatives uh if they are given some impetus from uh, uh from government in recognition of what they can do uh then we could see uh vast improvements particularly in the hard rock terrain areas where uh individual villages can uh, really take control of their own future uh if they understand that they're they're sharing a common pool resource and that um they need to operate it uh and manage it uh jointly in the more the more difficult one is the uh, the deep alluvial systems which uh require many people to cooperate in order to be able to be effective in the management and for that i think um uh, uh, some sort of centralized approach is going to be necessary to be able to put um uh an, an overall groundwater sustainability plan together uh that pe- people can uh, um believe would be achievable and and that they're given the means by which they can help to uh uh to regulate their the use and to uh and to be able to make that a groundwater sustainable thank you peter and also i think you're putting help some help together that's the connecting community and the data and so on so thank you so Dr. Nand Kumar, your final say.
yeah. I generally tend to agree with uh, what the other panelists have told, but I'm quite optimistic about uh, uh, expecting some improvements in the groundwater situation in the country, not probably in 10 years, but on a much little longer time frame because the initiatives of uh, the government and the other agencies, the social organizations all over the country have started showing results. And people have definitely become more aware about the importance of groundwater as a resource, which is as a limited resource. So this will definitely uh, make some changes in the way they treat groundwater. And this will be definitely helped by success of the projects like uh, uh, Adal Bhujal Yojana, Marvi, etc. Once we are successfully able to upscale this, this will definitely improve the groundwater situation in the country with the help of government and all other stakeholders. That is what is my gut feeling is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a great way to uh, sort of uh, bring the discussion to close. Uh, so I think what the, these three hours we spent together is a beginning. And I think uh, some of the findings from today's discussion uh, will put together and uh, it, will, it, it is a start. So we'll come back to you, to everyone who participated and uh, make uh, some initiatives that makes a difference. So thank you everyone. So now I hand over to Karen. Thank you very much, Basant. Um, and could I add my thanks to the speakers for their insights and also to our moderators for um, uh, supporting our breakout rooms today and to all the participants for your contribution. We do want to capture it in a report that um, leads to some meaningful activity. And um, we'd also like to invite you to um, share with us any case studies that you might have that we could include in that report. And so we're looking for case studies of your Australia-India bilateral research collaborations on water. We'll write to you um, with some information about that. So we want to publish those. Some of those will be included in our report and some on the Arch India website. Um, looking forward to seeing you again next Thursday, I hope, for our workshop on soil and water management for food security.